So for the record, Laura Subin, and I am the director of the Vermont Coalition to Regulate Marijuana, and I also served on the Tax and Regulate Subcommittee of the Governor's Marijuana Advisory Commission. Um, so I've been at this directing the coalition for many years now, and we um, um, eager, eagerly support this bill and the efforts that the Senate has made over the years to move Vermont towards a responsible system of tax and regulated sales. Um, we think this bill is fundamentally what it should be, uh, consumer, consumer protection legislation that will not only keep cannabis consumers safer, but will also improve the public health and public safety of the state as a whole. We also think that this bill provides a framework that, it, that will enable the emergent cannabis industry to be shaped in ways that reflect Vermont values. These include supporting for small Vermont farms and businesses, a commitment to product quality and environmental production pr protections. I think that this framework is all, also creates an opportunity to continue to address what is, to me personally, the most important priority, and that is the racial, social, and economic injustices that occur, have occurred in, during the Prohibition era. Ongoing criminal justice reforms, such as free and automatic expungement, of marijuana possession convictions are critical, and I know that this committee is working on expungement on another bill, and I look forward to those ongoing conversations. I think it's a really important piece of um, moving Vermont to where it needs to be. Um, <clears throat> we can also promote, com promote so, uh, these social pro justice priorities by increasing access to the legal cannabis industry by those that have been most harmed by prohibition. And we're seeing more and more initiatives in legal states around the country that are trying to do that. Um, and I'd be happy to offer anyone on the committee more, more information about those initiatives and how they're working. California is leading in this way. Massachusetts has, is doing some really interesting work well, in this regard. I've heard from two people so far, probably <clears throat> now you the third, about this issue. So I I'd like to understand more about what it is you're asking. One of them is Mark Hughes, who uh, I think is scheduled tomorrow, and David Silverman. Yeah. And now uh, you, and I'm not sure what it is that you're asking us to do in this bill. I don't disagree with the goal that you're talking about, but I'm not sure it belongs in a tax and regulated bill other than to get, you know, I think throughout the bill there are sections that address the that concern that would allow people um, to work and so forth, but I'm not sure you, like, just like I don't think we should be addressing the driver safety issues in this bill, I'm not sure we should be addressing um, those. So I guess I need to be, I need, and I'm sure members of the committee need to be convinced that it would be wise to put that in there. By the way, I did check with the Department of Corrections. There is nobody incarcerated in the state of Vermont for possession of marijuana only. There may be people who have that charge, who have other charges. There are eight people on probation in the state of Vermont for solely for marijuana conviction. Of that eight, five are above two ounces and three are below two ounces. We don't know because we never we had the two ounce, you know, was criminal. Uh, and when we legalized one ounce, we don't have a single thing. And I don't know what factors contributed to somebody being on probation for the possession of less than two ounces. So we can assume that the five that are on probation had more than two ounces. We know that. And the three had between one ounce and two ounces. Plus one ounce. So I, I, I'm not sure um, currently what the reasons are for those three people. Yeah. Well, we could dig down, but it's such a small group that we be identifying right. people for. Um, and so I'm not sure what to do. What? Well, yeah. But again, I just just for the record, so that you're aware of the number, the small numbers. And I hear that a lot from people. I'll stop locking people up for possession of marijuana. Right. Evidently, we're not. I think the much larger number are people with prior marijuana yeah. conviction, convictions, which is why I flagged the expungement issue. And I know you're dealing with that separately, and we can. I look forward to speaking to that in that context. But I think that's where. You the, think it, but I guess my question was originally: like, should 
should it be should the expungement of those records be part of this bill or a different bill? You know, I, I know that there is a mixed opinions in the advocacy community around that issue. I, I am fairly agnostic as long as it gets done. I, I hope and I think it needs to get done if not at the same time first. It's, I think that is one of the key pieces that should have gone really with last year's legislation because as you make this, as you recognize that this behavior shouldn't be criminal, then I think you should stop people from suffering the collateral, collateral consequences of those old convictions. So I think it's absolutely crucial how it gets done. I think that's a strategy question. I was going to say, you know, hindsight's 2020, just ask the referees before <laughs> Right. <laughs> So, but I think I think I think it's crucial, and I, I think it's crucial that the expungement be automatic and and cost free. So, um, to answer the first set of your questions, where do these equity um, prevent, do they belong in this bill? And I hope that you know I can flag as I go along. I was hoping to go through the bill a little bit. Um, so, and I, and, and I and I think they absolutely do because I think that if they're not at the forefront of the thinking around how this, this uh, emerging industry should unfold, they're gonna be neglected and it's gonna be, it's going to be catch up. And we're seeing that already in the states that have legalized without social equity provisions um, intentionally at the forefront. They're, they're, they're adding them after the fact and it's making it much more difficult to, to, to be successful. So the first place where, where you could do that is in, the crea in, is in the composition of the board that the bill would create. And you could do what Massachusetts, I urge you to do what Massachusetts did, did, did and have one of those appointees, um, require that one of those appointees have a background in social and economic justice. Now who should make that appointee is, is a complicated complicated question. I wouldn't mind if it was the Committee on Committees, but um, I, I think that, that that's another um, issue that would need more analysis. But to put that requirement in the composition of the board at the outset would mean that somebody was keeping that priority. Senator White's holding hearings on the board makeup right. today or tomorrow. So look into that. Government operations. So I'll, I'll keep that issue in mind as I go through, no, no, I'm I'm go through the bill. I'm, 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 I'm listening and I'm, I'm, I'm open to the most questions. Great. So just now moving through the bill a little bit. Um, so looking at Section 863, the regulation by local, local government. Um, we strongly support the language that the bill, in the bill that preserves local control. Um, by, by, in, of, by municipalities by allow, allowing opt out of cannabis establishments rather than having them opt in. I know that that was an issue on the commission um, and I think that this bill is taking the right approach. Um, opt out gives greater, greater predictability for businesses. It's consistent with Vermont's approach to alcohol. It's consistent with the approach of other states that have legalized adult use. Um, uh, uh, opt, opt in, on the other hand, could, would, that requirement could um, um, have negative impacts on ge uh, geographic distribution. It could consolidate marijuana establishments in certain communities, um, causing others to miss out on the economic opportunities associated with the industry. Um, and so we think that that's a really important approach. The commission as a whole didn't reach a recommendation on this issue, but the Tax and Regulate subcommittee did, and they also recommended op opt out. Um, the committee could also um, consider adding language that would go even a little bit infer further to ensure that, that a town or city's elected officials don't enact restrictions that effectively ban cannabis establishments, even when voters have, have not chosen to do that. <laughs> Looks like you're having something to say. In other words, through zoning, they you know, like Winooski makes, you can't allow it within a thousand feet of the school and there's no place, or a place where kids, playground, school, child care center, you'd end up with no place in Winooski. Exactly, you make it impossible for, for the, for the. I always pick on Winooski about that. <laughs> it's um, easy, but well, it's a compact community. Yeah. And when, when they were talking about sex offender res restrictions, you would effectively not allow any sex offender to ever live. Right, right. So this would be the same kind of thing. We do have sample language around that, if that would be helpful for the committee. Can you send that? Sure. Well, Can I just ask a question? Yeah. So are you objecting to a town doing zoning to not ban them, but to put them in a place where 
there could be a lot of traffic or the wouldn't be on the main street. No, not at all. I'm not objecting to that at all. It's just that there still needs to be some viable way for for a business to open in a community that hasn't opted out. Well, we're going to hear a little while from a select board member in Great Barrington Mass, which is a community that has, um, and I think he'll probably tell you that the biggest problem they've had is parking. Right. We have Great Barrington yeah. Rhode Island. Oh, no, it's Massachusetts, <laughs> not Rhode Island. Sorry. Um, moving on to Section 864, advertising. We recommend removing the a ban on advertising that represents the use of cannabis that, that represents the use of cannabis as curative effects, and instead only prohibiting advertising if it's not accurate. So we know that far more dangerous prescription drugs and can advertise. Um, and that we want patients to have access to accurate information to make informed decisions. Um, we also think that we, as, as the legal cannabis moves forward around the country and internationally, we'll learn more about curative effects of cannabis. And so um, that, ban, that ban doesn't make sense. And it, you want three to be eliminated? Is that what you're saying? No, we, we would like it to say that um, the ban on advertising, instead of, in, it should prohibit advertising that's not accurate, accurate instead, of, instead of specifically saying that cannabis doesn't have, that you can't have advertising that says cannabis has curative effects. I think that's covered by one. Um, so I, I, I think you're asking to strike three. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the bill in front of me. I so here. My, my question about it is um, it, it would criminalize um, a statement that claims curative effects, but we do have a medical marijuana program exactly. that that is built on the idea of therapeutic effects. therapeutic use of the symptoms. Right, but I, I think there's a there's such a vanishing line between those two things um, that it would be it would be difficult to draw the line between somebody advertising the well, therapeutic. Well, flagging these a decision for the committee to make, but I would point okay. out that. Um, one of the challenges we've had with the other body has been um, getting them to allow um, doctors to provide a card for anything, um, you know, any ailment that the person would like to have the symptoms dealt with, and they want specific ailments. And so, one of the things you, you, we always get into on that, we've got a bill that would give them a 16 opportunity to pass something more realistic, but it's always been the symptoms, and we've been careful because there is still a federal law. So it's, uh, but you would flag that as something that uh, you would look at. I don't know what the committee would decide. But. I think, and it, I think that if you, if you, you know, include they it. They want to reword it to fit the medical uh, definition that we have. Might be well, I think so. Previous versions of uh, what's passed in the Senate on TNR had um, this language, but it also said that you can't assert that it has either curative or therapeutic. So therapeutic is out in this version, and, and so it's whittled down to what previous versions are and, and curative. It's, it's straight up a policy decision for you whether or not you want Excellent. to regulate that. Um, so. Well, again, the flag that is an issue. But, uh, after you're finished, uh, people from the cannabis industry, the uh, medical, are going to speak, so maybe they have some thoughts about that. Too. Okay, great. Um, so moving on to Section 881, the rules concerning cultivators. Um, we welcome the language that says that the board shall consider the different needs and risks of small cultivators and, and accepting them from certain rules where appropriate. Um, and we think that this is going to, going to be critical in allowing small local farms to be competitive. Um, access is the key here. We need to create adequate access for small farmers and small businesses that will incentivize them to move from the illicit market into the regulated market. And so um, I, I, we applaud provisions like this that will allow that to happen. Um, Section 883, criminal background tracks. Um, while we appreciate the language that nonviolent drug offenses should, shall not automatically disqualify a candidate, um, which appears in a few places, uh, it's our feeling that the language does not go far enough. 
Um, other jurisdictions around the country are going much far farther, in fact, prioritizing application for people who do have prior cannabis convictions on the theory that the people that have been most harmed should have preferential access to the legal marijuana industry. Um, and we also think that there are other, there are many other nonviolent convictions that should not necessarily exclude someone from participation in a legal marijuana industry, um, and that, quite to the contrary, the economic opportunities of the industry, industry should be viewed as employment opportunities that can help break cycles of criminality and, and poverty. So um, we think that the committee could specify the type of criminal history that could dis disqualify someone. Um, this would, we, have, we had a lot of discussion of, about this on the commission. So bank fraud crimes or some kind of um, criminal history that actually would be relevant to a, to a person's ability to fairly and properly participate in a cannabis industry, but that these types of low-level marijuana misdemeanor convictions should not prohibit anyone from taking place in um, the legal industry. Well, Adam, if sponge, how would you know? Excuse me, if they're expunged, well, then they wouldn't have that conviction. They I mean, honestly say that. I as if this would take effect the day the bill passes and the police take a look at the timeline. So if the expungement works, as you done, I think that's taken care of because the record would, been, would have been expunged unless there was some un unbelievable reason not to. So, then I would suggest that the language in the bill isn't helpful. If it, if it says it wouldn't automatically, at, at a minimum, you could take out the word automatically, and so just say that the, the, that a prior conviction wouldn't disqualify, mm -hmm. and that might be an easier way to get at it. I mean, I agree with you. Ideally, there are no more um, convictions, but I would imagine that what will be expunged might not be the whole array of crimes that, that might still not make someone ineligible, ineligible to be a successful employee in a, in a cannabis industry, which include non-cannabis crimes. So if you have a, a, a minor misdemeanor in, in some other crime, that shouldn't disqualify you. I think that the language isn't helpful. It's more exclusionary than, than helpful. We are the witness. <laughs> um, moving on to Section 901 licenses. Um, uh, section 901 D2, the board shall develop tiers for cultivators' licenses placed based on the plant can canopy size of the, of the cultiva cultivation operation and may develop tiers for other licenses. So again, we think mandating tiered, li tiered licenses for cultivators is excellent. We applaud that and we think it really is essential to, give, to, to allow small farmers access. Um, and we think that this, uh, this language about other types of licenses is also important because then we can um, ensure access not only for small farmers but other types of small businesses. Um, I, we, I urge you to consider maybe going even further and considering some of the language from the commission where they, that where um, that not only did they do the tiered cultivation system but they also only, recommended only allowing the smallest tier initially and waiting for year two or, or, or at the discretion of a board to allow the, the larger, the, the licenses for um, middle and large scale operations. Um, I think that would go even further to ensure access and to have people come out of the illicit market and to keep away, I think one of the other goals that we've heard, we've talked a lot about over the years is doing this for the Vermont way and not having, quote, big marijuana come and take over Vermont <coughs> businesses. Would there be a, I think the concern when drafting the bill and putting it in was with how do you ensure an adequate supply? And I, I think that, I mean, that's, that's the million dollar question and I know, I understand that struggle. I read the story last night from seven days about the supply in Burlington to the store that's operating right now, evidently. Um, very interesting that he runs out of supply in two hours. Um, whether that's true or not, who knows, but one like Burlington. Well, Canada, Canada, same thing, Montreal. They ran out almost immediately, uh, the demand was so strong. Yeah. Of course, the difference is in Burlington. It's not so. Right, right, <laughs> and you have. I mean, you but have. But he's already running out of supply when it's not legal. Mm -hmm. So. Right. 
Well, and if you have a timeline that allows for the cultivators to yeah. get going, we know that there are, you know, there are large numbers yeah. of illegal cultivation operations and also legal um, hemp cultivators that could pretty readily switch over to illegal marijuana cultivation. And so, if you if you give them a shot and let the small farmers go first, um, and I think supply and demand is going to be an ongoing question. I don't think there is there is a clear way around it, except to, to I, I I think it is wise that you've created a board that could respond quickly to supply and demand issues. I still think it makes sense to give the small farmers a shot first and see how if they can meet <coughs> supply and demand. Um, also, in regard to licenses, um, the, I think the committee should consider allowing additional types of licenses or allowing the board to, at its discretion, create um, additional types of licenses. For example, the tax and regulated sub Tax and Regulate Subcommittee talked about um, a separate, separate sales representative license, which would be similar to the sales representative license for alcohol beverages, and would be allowed, if this license would be allowed, available only to the smallest tier, and they could, it would allow small cultivators to sell their products directly to consumers at retail for a free fee that's lower than a full retail operation. So that's just one example, but the, the, ta the Tax and Regulate Say that again, they would be able to sell they would be able they would to sell directly <laughs> to retailers without going through at, at a lower at a lower fee than having a full retail oh, oh, license, oh, okay. and all the other restrictions on selling right, okay, directly okay. Would, would would apply. They, would, they wouldn't be able to open a farm stand on Williston Road. Right. No. No. All the others would apply. The idea okay. was was that it would give them a way to um, you know uh, market their products directly to consumers, but still within the regulated system. Whether or not that type of license appears to you, appeals to you, you may want to create room for the board to, to create additional types of licenses. Another one that I think is very important and that um, um, you might want sooner than, rather than later to reconsider is uh, licenses for special events um, because we know that that's also, that's happening in the illicit world already um, and that if someone could get an, an, um, a license to um, for, for special events weddings what have you any kind of events when then it would also could possibly create opportunities for cannabis entrepreneurs to market to have another um, market so you could have the X craft cannabis at your wedding at your party or whatever be have set up there so you could have those types of special event licenses um, we also have sample. How do you deal with a public place? The, with a public, that's what I'm saying. This would be a license that would be uh, allow it in these particular types of public events. Um, and we have sample language around that that issue too. If you'd be interested in seeing any of that. So um, to clarify, you're saying that. The special license would include the ability to sell at the event, but also for people to consume right. at the event. I, my preference would be both, but at a minimum to consume. So that is something that um, could be, and, and I know that there is some um, difference among legal scholars about what exactly constitutes a public event, um, and this could um, clean up some of that, so that if you had a special event license, then, then, then you're okay in the eyes of the law and you don't have to get into the, the, the officers on the scene determining whether a particular event is a public event. Um, and we know that these are issues that are happening in the real world right now. Events are happening and there is this calculus um, by local police departments about whether they constitute public events or private events. There should be no, honestly, right now, there shouldn't be any question from anybody in law enforcement. If they read the damn bill, or the law, excuse me, they know what the law says. I'm tired of hearing that there's questions about what the law says, either on gifting or on the sale. Um, I mean, a public consumption at a public place. Clearly in the statute that the governor signed, whatever, it says a public place. And it's, I don't know how you can read it if you're a law enforcement officer and think it says something else. Now, whether we change the public place or whether we change that, that'd be one thing. I, I'm just dumbfounded by some law enforcement who say it's not clear. I just don't understand it. But we do know that that's ha that has happened. No, I know. Yeah. People say it's not so, clear. But yeah, it is clear. yeah. 
Well, and I think this would be one way to make it e even more clear, and I also think that this would be a way for people that want to make 100% sure they're, they're complying with the letter of the law, that my event is okay, I'm, do I'm doing the right thing, it's everything that I'm doing is legal, I, I could go and get a special yeah. event license, and that would be another way to make it. No, I understand what you're saying, I'm just yeah. saying current, that yeah. you would have to change that part of the law. Yeah. Currently, I thought it was fairly clear. Um, should I carry on? <laughs> no, no, that's okay. And, and I think, I mean, I think Senator Baruth raised some issues about, you know, the public place is, is law, is restricted. So we do have this problem of people not having tourists not having access to a public place to consume. We also, to flag another economic justice issue, I think there is a real one here as far as banning all public places. And this gets into whether you want to reconsider lounges or in short order allow a board to, because if, you, if I own my own home, I can consume and cultivate legally um, in, my, in my home absent consent of the landlord or, or never, if I am in federally subsidized housing, can I consume cannabis legally? So there, there are real economic justice issues there when you don't give any, uh, any, if you can't consume privately at home and you have no public place to consume, it's not fair. So, um, so I'm moving on to section 903, which is um, the priorities in licensing. Um, and we support all the licensing priorities that, are, that the bill would establish. But we think that this is another place where, where um, these articulated priorities could go much further towards promoting social justice goals. So in addition to prioritizing minority and women-owned businesses and, and those that would create opportunities for minorities and women, priorities should be given to applicants, applicants that can demonstrate that they were harmed by prohibition or that they are a resident of a community or would establish a cannabis business in a community disproportionately impacted by prohibition. And they could demonstrate this in their application based on, on public records, arrest records, or and, uh, um, demographic information. Um, and I think that would be really helpful in supporting underserved communities to come and be a part of this legal market. I, That's section 903 priorities. I do understand the logic. So if, if we essentially flip societies viewpoint of cannabis uh, from an illegal one in which these people were nefarious actors um, to they were um, unfairly uh, targeted by the system, and perhaps jailed or, or other things. And I can understand how that point in a, in a kind of final piece of the logic take you to the point where they should be preferred. But when I pull back from it a little bit, it's a little odd. So, so we're saying that people with clean criminal records who never, never ran afoul of the law are would be second in line behind people who um, may have may have been uh, you know unfairly targeted by the system, but may not may not have may have committed offenses that were um, <coughs> I don't know. I, for which I would think that they should at least be even with the person who never committed a crime. So, so I, I, I find myself having a hard time thinking of giving a preference to people because by that logic you would give more preference to somebody with a longer criminal record, right? And, and the, the most preference would be for the person with the longest criminal record. And that, I just find a, a tough well, I think that if it was a long criminal record only for minor possession crimes, yeah. that the logic holds true that it was wrong to criminalize that behavior in the first place, and this person has been suffering under mm -hmm. under this regime mm -hmm. that was wrong, and we're trying to rectify some of right. some of those wrongs. But I also think that the harm when you think about people that have been harmed by prohibition, it's not just the person that got a, a marijuana conviction; it's the person that. Um, was too poor to pay the $200 fine associated with a marijuana conviction and so ended up having other pro um, problems with the criminal justice system. Or it's the child of someone who had, was, was impacted by marijuana prohibition. And well, we wouldn't be sure of that sort of person. We would only have a conviction. It could be someone who came from a 
an extremely privileged background, mm -hmm. who just for right. reasons of character decided to run afoul of the law for right. reasons unrelated necessarily to economic justice. So this recommendation is not around prior marijuana convictions. It's around showing harm. And so I think in an application process, you could easily, the person could look at an application and say, this minor conviction has, you have not demonstrated that this showed, caused you the kind of tangible harm that entitles you to this priority. I think also to look at the communities that have been hardest hit by marijuana prohibition and um, maybe broader um, war on drug provisions, if you look at those communities and I say, I want to start my business, I am from this community, I want to start my business in this com community, I want to employ members of this community, so I should deserve a priority in licensing. And I think that's another way to show, to benefit people that have been harmed by marijuana convictions and doesn't create the problem that you're concerned about. I just about. think then we've, we've put this five member commission in a really, um, almost untenable place because they would basically become a reparations commission in considering licenses. They'd be, they'd be weighing these extremely complex factors of was this person more harmed or that person more harmed? And I don't think they're gonna have the time to do that, but also it's, it's not a task that I think is doable on a mass basis in a fair, in a fair way unless you have a body that's only looking at those things. They're also thinking about you know, the, the whole business of cannabis. So I guess I'm comfortable with the way the bill reads that they're, they're not disqualified. I'd be happy to look at language that said they're on an equal footing. I just have a hard time with the idea that convictions <coughs> by preference over people who have never been convicted. Well, you do create an incongruity. Point yeah. that out. I think one of the incongruities that immediately jumped to my mind is people that have had their records expunged no longer have a record. So they would go behind the people that didn't get expunged. So I, you, know, I, you can carry this thing. We need to be careful when you write the law that there aren't intended consequences, unintended consequences. And I, I'm fearful if we go too far down that road, you run into that unintended consequence. I don't disagree that minorities and people who have been harmed by prior prohibition should you know, get a preference. On the other hand, I, I, I shared Senator Baruch's concern, but I think one way to um, deal with that is in the year that it would take to set up the whole licensing scheme and everything else, is to make sure that those people who were, you know, well, we might argue about who they are, but those that have, you know, have a record are expunged. They're, there may be some of those eight that I described that are on probation. They might have been the eight pound, 20 pound, 50 pounds. Um, they may have been convicted of, you know, of trafficking, but yet are on probation. So um, something else is going on there. And the other three could be juveniles where, you know, this was what they charged them with. So I don't know. Um, I can find out more if we, if we need to. But I think. Um, we need to understand, we need better information from the Center for Justice Research. That's their name now. I don't, I never get their name. Crime Research Group. Group. Crime Research Group. If they could give us some statistics on um, the number of drug crimes um, charged and convicted um, in the last 10 years some of that kind of information and using all the drugs. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure I want to let a heroin dealer um, necessarily have a preference over somebody who's never been convicted. Right. Or who <laughs> had the record that. expunged. But uh, I think that at some point you're going to have to ask why wasn't that record expunged. Right. Well, I think that if the committee is not comfortable, and, and so and this idea of prioritizing um, people with prior cannabis convictions is not original to me or my no, position. I, it's happening in places in jurisdictions in California. Again, if you think about the, I know it's not original, yeah. but if you think about the incongruity, I got my yeah. record expunged, so I know I'm coming behind the person that couldn't get it. Right. So I, 
I think that you could expand the social justice language in Section 903, even if you're not comfortable going that far, to make it more inclusive of a variety of, of, of uh, underserved populations that could benefit from prioritized access to a, a regulated cannabis market. Um, Section 909 fees. Um, I would urge the committee to set to set a maximum fee in statute. I understand that um, you, it, the, rec, the proposals it allows for tiered fees, right, consistent with a tier, tiered cultivation. Uh, I mean, tiered licenses for different size businesses. But if the maximum fee is not um, embedded in the statute, I worry that if it's too high, again, people will not move from the illicit market to, to the regulated market. And um, so that I think that cap should be should be in statute. And that is, that's also where, where the commission well, came out. Well, uh, well, the intent here of anything with fees is in the finance committee. Right. OK. So but you know, the intent was to allow the fees to get the, the Cannabis Commission to set the fees, or recommend fees, and then for the legislature and the governor, obviously, to decide what those fees would be. Right. So it's not necessarily the Cannabis Commission setting the fee, it would be the legislature on the recommendation. But I don't know what the, I mean, the Finance Committee is taking this up really shortly, and I, I will defer to them on fees and tax rates. So I would pick, I, to, from my perspective, the key would be to have a cap on the fees for the smallest businesses. Otherwise, you're going to defeat your goals of, 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 of undermining the illicit market because people won't switch over. Um, you could have, and you could also have language that said something like fees should not be allowed to exceed the amount that is reasonably necessary to cover the costs of regulation. Well, that's the idea yeah. of the fee. The fee right. can right. only be what it costs to operate the, the system. Right. The fee is not designed to bring in government revenue. The fee is designed. I'm not calling. Okay. Uh, sorry. No the, the fee is designed to. You know, all throughout government, whether it be elevator fees or whatever the fee is, it's only supposed to be what it costs to operate for the state. Right. So that's and and I know that this is a, a, a priority concern, but in all the sort of cannabis industry hopeful events that I go to, one of the greatest concerns if, for that people articulate over and over again is. Are these fees and lights going to be too high for me to be able to enter? I'm just a small, yeah, I'm mean, a lot of money. Et cetera, and you got the case in New Northampton, Massachusetts, where a company wanted to set up business, and yes, we'll we'll let you in, even though they, the town would get certain revenue. But yeah, we'll let you in. You need to make a ten thousand dollar donation to this organization right. or that organization. Right. Mm -hmm. And Massachusetts Commission is now struggling with that type of um, activity. Um, so that was the end of what I had specific to the bill itself. I did have a couple of areas that I um, just felt like I wanted to touch on based on to break testimony that I've heard in this committee recently. Um, and so one of those issues is edibles, and I'm very glad that the bill contemplates allowing edibles. I think it's absolutely critical. I think that it is, um, I, I, if anyone saw the, the article last night, it, it, is, it doesn't pass a straight face test to assert that there's not already a black market in edibles. It's a robust and growing black market, an illicit market, I'm sorry, in, in edibles. And um, it absolutely should come, edibles should, I mean, other infused products should come under any responsible tax and regulated system. Not only do we want to undermine this illicit market, but it's in these kinds of products where regulation can be most helpful as far as purity, potency, dosage, everything that we want our consumers to know about what they're getting. Um, so even more than the economic um, generators, I think this is at, this is absolutely, absolutely crucial. The place where my mind has changed over the last four years, started to develop the first introduced the bill. That's 241. Yeah. Well, and, and, and there are, and I think that there has been a change in, yeah. in how cannabis is consumed and some of the reasons why. We don't want to push people towards smoking. Um, we want people to be able to choose an array of products that might be safer, more beneficial, et cetera. 
Similarly, I know that um, in testimony the other day, delivery was not something that you wanted to contemplate. Um, but I urge you to reconsider that position for, for many of the same reasons. There is right now illicit delivery services going on all over the state of Vermont. They're, they are prevalent, they're growing, they're going to continue to operate illegally unless we regulate them legally. Um, we also, delivery can also achieve other goals like um, ge uh, geographic distribution in places that are, you know, kind of can't access, get access, easy access to a store. Um, it, it, it encourages some of the privacy. It, it does meet other goals, but I think the primary <coughs> issue that, that I think the committee should consider delivery sooner rather than later is it's, it's one of those things that will continue to be Vermont putting its head in the sand if we don't recognize that this is happening in an unregulated way right this minute all around the state. Um, so I think it's really important. We also know Massachusetts is going to have delivery probably as soon as April. They're writing the rules on that right now. Um, and so that's the we look at our neighbor and what's well, happening there. there. I think they still allow alcohol delivery in Massachusetts. I think this is going to happen anyway. And so it's either going to happen regulated or unregulated. And, it, and, and so I would prefer for it to be regulated, to be, for it to be safer, for it to deliver people people with licenses to be checking IDs at the door, um, to have standards where we can feel safer about what's happening. The majority happening. of the committee agrees with that? Um, and the, yeah, and that, that was it. The final thing I wanted to say was about public consumption, but I already covered that. So that was <coughs> our reaction to the bill. Question? So, uh, thank you. Where is the question? Just question. So, what about um, what, what are your thoughts on very big operations coming in, setting up shop? In very big, people with a lot of money, investor groups coming in, buying a lot of farms. What's your take on that? I think that we need to do everything we can to discourage that. I think that you that that it um, <coughs> is very difficult to fully ban large operations um, and that we do have this supply and demand question and we're going to have to um, see how that plays out. I think that we, you've, you, what you, this framework has a number of protections against that by prioritizing small local businesses. Um, I think my hope would be that, that um, they, I think that they, that it is somewhat inevitable that they, because I don't think they can be banned completely. If I if I had my way, they, they would be. I'd love to see only craft um, cultivators, but I don't think that's realistic. I also think that there are um, many cultivators have concerns about um, if we li what these limits are and whether they be ar arbitrary. So if I have a success successful small operation, shouldn't I be allowed to? Um, grow my company into a larger and larger operation and wouldn't that be some people would argue that's a Vermont success story and so limiting large op grows altogether um, is problematic in that way so I think that as long as we continue to ensure that there's access for small farmers small businesses on an ongoing basis and we protect that and we create a Vermont brand that's about quality and like much as we have in the craft beer industry and we promote that through, through our branding and marketing, um, we can have a successful industry in Vermont <coughs> and that it might have to coexist with the equivalent of a Budweiser the same way Vermont's craft brewers are success, successfully coexisting with large national and international alcohol manufacturers. I mean, I think without the without some straight, you know, very clear guidelines, you know, prioritize. But it's going to be a human decision. It's not going to be a straight, bright line. Yes, no, and so therefore it's going to be all over. Well, and so one of the things, one of my earlier recommendations, where where you start with only allowing the smallest businesses, could be a way to address that concern. And if those small businesses are meeting demand and operating successfully. And then you wouldn't be you wouldn't be compelled to add the larger licenses. So you could just leave it at you know you could leave the language at that. And um, I think that would be a really good way to start. Yeah. Vermont has moved slowly in other ways, and that that would be a, a way of moving slowly that would also benefit our small farms and small businesses. Could only have one license. 
That's that's. You can thing. only have one license of each type, and and each license only allows for one location. So in the case of like a big corporation buying a bunch of different farms, I mean, I guess if they're all part of next to each other, something like that. Yeah. But you couldn't have you know a big corporation come and have you know farms all over the state under one cultivation license. Well, we could all get different. Well, I know on the. That was the concern on the commission that you, if you, the more you try to outright ban people, entities will find ways to get around some, uh, certain kinds of outright bans. But I think that the language about limiting how how a business can be vertically integrated and how many license, the number of licenses are are excellent attempts at, attempts at controlling what you're concerned about. Yeah. And, and I'm I'm always making the comparison to alcohol. We've been pretty successful in terms of being a, a heavy con control state uh, in terms of licenses with making sure that you don't have people you know, accumulating licenses and aggregating licenses. So I don't see why we can't do the same thing here. I think what you're saying makes sense, that we, we start with strong preferences for strong growers, uh, small growers, and we limit one license per operation. Could some you know, person work out a scheme where they have near majority control of a number of licenses, maybe, but you have this this board that's gonna have its ear to the ground. I think they can see that sort of thing happening. Um, so I'm not saying it, it won't be problematic ultimately in one way or another, but I think our small size protects us in a certain way from the immediate takeover by these guys. If if we have these restrictions to one license per um, cultivator or, or seller, um, in the same way that it's worked with alcohol. You have someplace like Pearl Street Beverage in, in Burlington is like one of the biggest stores in the state, but they don't own any other stores. They don't control any other stores. Um, the distributors are the only ones that really reach scale um, across the state, and that's because the laws were set up to allow them to Sometimes there's the advantages to being the first witness, and sometimes it's <laughs> disadvantages. Hey, it's a pleasure. <laughs> I can so do this all day. Thank you very much for being <laughs> thank here. You. And, thank uh, you. We're going to call Ed Abrams, the vice chair of the Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Um, and Great Barrington has just started. Um, what happened? Nothing. Oh, it was you see that. Okay. And, 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 and the great Barrington has just started uh, to oh, see the chair. Yeah. 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 Sears, the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and I'm talking to you from Montpelier. I represent Bennington County, and um, a mutual acquaintance of ours uh, mentioned you, and I'm so pleased that you're willing to talk with us about great Barrington Mass's uh, experiences with cannabis. You've just opened a store there, I understand, and uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about what the experience has been like. Sure. Um, it, we had a medical dispensary open about a year ago. Um, and the way it was rolled out in Massachusetts, um, medical became legal. And then when recreational use was um, voted to be legal, part of that process gave the medical establishment the uh, first dibs on the first licenses. So we left. July 1st, technically, is when um, anyone who wanted to do adult use uh, marijuana like that sales could go to their local communities for what's called the community host agreement. And if anybody at all, these medical and recreational places who wanted to do adult use, could go to the local. So we, um, we had four applicants come to us. Uh, very close to that uh, first date. Um, the 
medical, uh, they had medical ones had an edge, so they opened first. Uh, and when they got their, after they get licensed from us, they go to the state, um, jump through an awful lot more hoops, and the state gave them their license. Uh, they opened about two or three, two weeks ago, I think. Uh, the others we expect to open sometime in the spring. So how many um, how many outlets will you end up with in Great Barrington? So as a, we in Great Barrington, one of the things our state law did was give an awful lot of discretion to the community about where and how many. Uh, they set a minimum number we can't go below based on the number of liquor stores which they regulate. regulate. Um, and in our case, that would have been one. So we could have stopped it at one. The town opted not to put any limit to what the market to figure that out. Mm -hmm. So right now, there are four, um, four, like I said, who came immediately and applied. Uh, one more has made their intention, or actually has started the process of applying, also retail. And I have spoken to somebody who is moving forward to do manufacturing of chocolate, kind of use chocolate which would be our first non-retail uh, marijuana facility. So as of now, there are you know, probably likely five uh, retail shops that will be open. Um, but again, it's, it's up to the market as far as we're concerned. Okay. What are, have you, I know uh, Channel 10, I think, did a story on uh, people coming from New York to Great Barrington and vice versa and back again. Have you right. had, um, uh, have there been any problems with uh, sales or people that are coming? One of our concerns, um, and something that the, the state didn't require, but locally we require, is to try and inside the store reminding people of the physical people where you're going back to, you should know that. Uh -huh. um, we have not heard of any, and uh, anecdotally, uh, looking from the license plate, in their parking lot and the parking lot around them, uh, it's an awful lot of uh, New York and Connecticut to a lesser extent Vermont um, license plates. So a lot of it is going out of state. I don't know the Connecticut laws. I think New York is relaxed possession laws. It's not legal, but it's, right. I think. Did yeah. they decriminalize? Um, I have not heard about the you know, state police sitting at the border pulling people over. Um, I haven't heard of it being a problem yet with driving, which is everybody's biggest fear. Um, you know, it's like, like there, it's, it's not legal to consume it publicly. So if you, so the question is, if you don't live here, um, unless you're staying at a you know, hotel or bed and breakfast that allows consumption, um, you're, not, uh, you're not consuming it here, so you are taking it across state lines. Um, it's not really an issue for us, and it, like I say, what what is the system in in Massachusetts for? What is the town share of any revenue or sales tax or whatever is charged for the marijuana? Do you have a do you get a yeah. share? The state the state share of the tax is about seventeen percent, and that includes the regular sales tax. Then there's a local option of up to three percent that we can do. Um, so we should raise it to 20, which well, we jumped on. Um, so the locally we get 3%. percent so the state paying 17, we get 3. Then the community host agreement that they're required to have allows us up to another 3% um, community impact fee, it's called. Uh, according to the cannabis regulation, we have to justify that fee that it, it's actually to cover additional expenses relating to marijuana. So that can be things like um, you know, more police to, or training our police to spot impaired drivers and just a breathalyzer like that. It could include um, education to keep teens from um, smoking. Uh, it, it's pretty wide what we can put under that 3%, but according to the Kansas law, we have to be able to justify it. So according to the Department of Revenue, the State Department of Revenue, um, once the money comes in, the money belongs to the town like any other money, and can't be spent without town meeting approving it. Um, so those two, they're still in the complex, and the town meeting is now we'd like to use them to lower our taxes for the 
things we're already doing um, were in conflict. But uh, we found that the the applicants for the host agreement had no problem with either. They're all expected to make lots of money. So nobody said we're going to challenge you on that for your first time. Yeah. So the total, um, the total tax in Great Barrington is 26%. 23 percent. So the, the state is 17. We put three. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's like another three. Um, then we also, when we were putting together those post agreements, we were looking at other towns. Some of them, an awful lot of them, asked. I, I say asked. I mean, if you want one of these agreements, you have to say yes. They asked for a contribution to a local nonprofit. Yeah. Um, sometimes working with health and health, sometimes not of ten or fifteen thousand dollars, and some of them ask for a one-time or an annual fee. Some of them up to fifty thousand, just because. Um, the the Canada Control Commission, our state agency, sort of views both of those as uh, a flag would be extortion. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing in the law that allows that. So we we immediately took out those big fees. Um, none of the applicants had a problem with the ten thousand dollar donation to a local nonprofit. They all said they would do that anyway. Um, but I don't think there's any justification for it, um, other than they understand they have a you know a lot of years of reputation that will come. So a ten thousand dollar donation to the library um, and uh, the girls and boys club, and we'll give you a right. license, that sort of thing. Right. Um, well, I grew up in yeah, Massachusetts, yeah. so that yeah. I grew up in Massachusetts, so that takes me back to the years when you had to get a liquor license in Mass. Yeah, that uh, we just had kind of a liquor license. Yeah. Um, have you had any problems besides parking? No, we um, you know luckily for us, we weren't first; we were third. Uh, you know, two towns. Uh, Leicester um, right here, Worcester and um, Northampton. Yeah. That, so we all, as soon as that happened, and when I found out ours was packed, with the, the dispensary, the store in touch with the police, and they didn't pay for a police detail up front. I believe every moment they've been open, and I think it's still there, just to direct traffic. Uh, they're right off the main road, but with a lot of parking, and they contracted core parking. Um, so it is heavy. In the very beginning, a couple of their neighboring stores complained politely, and they addressed it. We officially there was no place for their customers. So the police have been helping with that. So there have been, as far as I know, zero problems. Um, there's a line. And whenever they've been open, there's a line. Uh, it was minus 11 degrees one day, and there was a line. Um, I think the line has gotten shorter. Uh, it's soon that will stop at some point when there's more competition and when there's less phenology and when you guys are doing it. Well, this is extremely helpful to me and I think to the committee. Uh, does anybody have any questions on the committee? Senator Nick? I'm just wondering, what about um, after somebody purchases and they would like to go to their car and smoke there? Is that, is that something? It's not legal. No. It's not legal no. to smoke in your car? Right. Even when no. parked? And this, this part of the law that at the state level allowed for uh, cannabis cafes in places where on premises consumption would be legal. And just in, in trying to get this up and running in a reasonable amount of time, they put that on hold. Oh. And they're now taking it up again. The big question I have with that and with your question is how do you get home? Um, you know, out the hall, we're all used to having a designated driver. I have trouble picturing you know, going out with a bunch of friends and have somebody not getting high. They get you home, but maybe people will jump that way. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, you know, that's everyone's biggest fear is assuming it in the car. My guess is people go home first with it. Not for the most part, just because it, it seems crazy to drive with it. But, um, Okay, thanks. And that apparently is paying for police to how to protect it, but I don't know how you know, how to hold up in court. Um, but I, I, I'm definitely not aware of I see. Senator Baruch, thank you. Uh, thank you. This is very helpful. 
My question is about the nonprofits. So, yeah. is it is it uh, at completely at the applicant's choice which nonprofit? So some of the some of the towns and readers I looked at, um, they would they one some of them created a foundation run by the you know the town to decide where the money goes. We decided just to leave it up to the uh, the individual, um, to the individual applicants, you know, the pawn shop, which they decide who they want to give it to. Um, we put the word local nonprofit in there. We didn't define how local that means. Um, and we, I think we could help them on this, um, but that we have a local community center. Um, they're trying to get some. Most of them seem to identify by youth group we have in town that have actually started to address the heroin problem many years ago. Um, they do all sorts of programming, but they also do teen education. Um, an interesting question I had for that youth group is, are you comfortable taking this money, uh, given where it comes from? Um, and yeah, I think they more or less go with, you know, the only thing I have to say about taking this money is taking enough of it. Um, <laughs> There, there. Well, thank you. I was, I was. It, it is legal and it's out there. And this, so what their concern is that it be done in a way that protects teens, which is what I think we're all thinking about. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I got to tell you, this has been extremely helpful to me to hear from somebody who's on the front lines as a select board member and dealing with it in their community. Um, and more power to you. And I hope Vermont can catch up in the near. Future. Well, financially speaking, take your time. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't want competition from Bennington. There's a couple of things to think about. But, um, you know, it, it passed overwhelmingly, the state vote uh, it passed overwhelmingly, and then all of a sudden, all the community who thought it was a great idea, apparently, started talking about the yeah. Um And the, the way the state set it up, uh, and look into that with the CCC, but towns can opt out. So you know, make it not legal. And there's different mechanisms depending on whether the majority of voters vote against or no. I know you didn't do it that way. Right. Um, the other issue is um, immediately people started talking about limits. We got four applicants in the middle of the story. We didn't want to opt down to just have to look at it. No. Um, I don't think that discussion is over yet. Interestingly, all every applicant we've had who has applied for marijuana like marijuana license has said formally or informally we should look at the number of which is the reason I don't want to. I don't want to make millionaires out of it, but it gives you what is concerned with the goal is my view. There is a there are people who have to run with the number. Um, again, this is a long winded way of saying the state has given us a lot of leeway locally. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a fair amount of control with zoning. We can't zone it out of business, but we can put it where it is. In Great Barrington, we chose to not restrict retail is allowed any of them. Retail marijuana is allowed anywhere retail is allowed, except within 200 feet of the school, which doesn't really affect anywhere. And, um, but we, we could put, there are other towns around us that are saying they don't want it in a pretty, pretty historic downtown. They want it out of the shopping center. Um, there are other towns who are limiting the number of that, so they don't have them all over. Um, they also, the, the state limited what they can look like, so you can't see products from the window. You can limit the names of them. Um, but I, I guess where I was going is, we have a fair amount of local control, which has been wonderful. So we didn't choose to exert too much of it in Great Barrington, but a lot of the smaller towns around us have. Um, as far as where they are, how many there are, I think we can even control out of the operations with a reasonable limit. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, sure. Very helpful. I, and that, for those of folks who don't know about Great Barrington, it's a great little town in uh, the Berkshires, which is also a tourist area. So you're dealing with travel and tourism as well as we do in Vermont. So um, it's very helpful to hear from somebody right on the front lines. Thank you so much, Ed. Appreciate it. You're welcome.
Thank you for having us. My name is Shane Lynn. I'm the Executive Director of Champlain Valley Dispensary in Southern Vermont Wellness, which is in Brattleboro. Yep, nice to meet again. Uh, and I'm Monique McHenry, the Research Director of Vermont Patients Alliance. Uh, and thanks for having us again. It's you know, been uh, many years coming in front of you all and appreciate the opportunity uh, to speak about S54. And also, uh, we put together a little list of some of the impact that last year's bill, July 1st bill, had on the dis dispensary program. And we just kind of wanted to highlight how things have changed for us over the past year with, uh, with July 1st passing last year. Um, we have been operating up to nearly six years at this point. Uh, there's roughly uh, 5,300 patients on the registry. Uh, this is the first year it's actually gone, uh, gone down. There was a high of about 5,600 patients on the dispensary. It's down to about 5,300 right now. Um, and we're looking at the reasons for that and, and looking at uh, one of them being costs for, for IDs. Uh, you know, you still have to pay a $50 fee. You still have to renew each year and go to visit your doctor, and so there's a cost there as well. Uh, additionally, the paperwork involved uh, for just going through the process can be cumbersome versus potentially um, asking your neighbor for cannabis. Uh, another thing that we've seen is our dry flower sales have really decreased dramatically, uh, and that's in reflection to the illegal market and how much dry flower is available. Our edibles and concentrates are down a little, but not nearly as much as dried flour. Um, another, you know, the reason for this is the significant um, influence of the unregulated and illegal market. Uh, Senator Sears mentioned the uh, Seven Days article uh, last night, uh, and that's something that really has affected us. Um, there, there's an abundance of, of product available on the market, and back to the hurdles that patients face in trying to sign up for the program, going to their doctor. Uh, sometimes it's just much easier for them to talk to their neighbor or have someone deliver it at this point. As Jennifer had mentioned this morning, there are numerous delivery services throughout Vermont that will uh, drive to your house and deliver uh, illegal uh, cannabis. Our concern with the illegal market is uh, it's really, I think, signifies the urgency that uh, a, a regulated market is needed at this point in the state. Uh, we're concerned about cons uh, consumer protection, basically, uh, and back to uh, Vermont brands that want to be in this market in the future. Uh, a well-regulated market will protect those businesses as well, as, as well as protect the medical program. Um, another issue that we do face is, and we're talking to patients, is the confusion out there. Um, they really uh, haven't had the opportunity to potentially read the bill and understand what July 1st meant, and so they're confused by it. So we have to uh, educate patients uh, on the medical program and what is possible with the July 1st uh, passage last year. Uh, and so that confusion is really, again, it just, um, when people are ill, uh, they sometimes seek the, the path of least resistance to, to finding their medicine. Um, another uh, downturn for us is with legal cultivation with the bill passed last year. Uh, we used to sell a lot of clones and seeds to patients and they'd come to us to buy those. Uh, now they don't really do that anymore because they can get them on the illegal market. Um, another uh, large influence has been uh, the hemp market that has uh, expanded and really grown. There was a VPR story this morning on you know, how many acres are up, 5,000, 6,000 acres of hemp at this point. A lot of that hemp is cannabis by the federal definition. Uh, and what we're seeing is a lot of people can access uh, this cannabis hemp product that has CBD in it. And so they can get certain ratios of uh, THC to CBD, again, on the illegal market. And before they'd come into the dispensary, and we'd be able to find dried flour that would have those ratios for them. But right now, with uh, the amount of hemp out there that's really cannabis, uh, we're struggling to keep up with yeah, that diversity. Are you explaining that? Are you alleging that stores that are selling CBD oil are actually selling marijuana cannabis? Um, I'd say that, I mean, that I, Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that there's certain uh, that in growing uh, hemp and that definition of 0 0.3 THC level to define hemp versus cannabis that people that are growing sometimes go over that that definition of hemp cannabis 
And I think the Ag Department has tested and that the 50% of the samples that they've tested have been hot, meaning that they are over 0 0.3. Uh, and so at that point, 50%? The they're all, well, you're going to test the right that you told that story. Yeah. Um, I'm, that's, see what happens when you legalize and don't regulate. Um, uh, so that's been a big influence uh, on people signing up to the registry. Again, the amount of product that's that's currently available to people without signing up to the dispensary system is uh, is really dramatic, and it's the most it's ever been in the state of Vermont. And that has infected us uh, negatively and changed our forecasts and our projections of hiring people or not hiring people, making investments in the company. Uh, and so we're trying to, you know, adapt to kind of some of the unknowns here. And uh, again, uh, you know, that's I think the reason why we do support um, a program that's well regulated going forward. So, uh, and lastly, just uh, um, you know, recognizing that uh, the the hurdles in the medical program are a challenge for people uh, to sign up, and we'd love to see uh, a reduction of those hurdles, and so that it's just an easier process for them to sign up. Uh, and some of those hurdles are a three-month healthcare patient-doctor relationship, um, getting a healthcare provider signature. Uh, you know, uh, if people can just access cannabis on the legal market, uh, I think it would be nice for them to be able to access the dispensary system uh, a little easier uh, than currently in place. And those were kind of my comments on, uh, about July 1st uh, law from last year. And then Monique was going to uh, comment on uh, S54. So um, we do appreciate the recognition of the importance of the medical marijuana program and registry in S54. Um, and despite the proposed expansion of adult use in Vermont, there's many advantages uh, that the medical marijuana program has. I think that's why we're here to speak on it, is to make sure it's sustainable if adult use rolls out. Um, and so many of our patients want to continue to be served by the program. As James pointed out, there is some confusion among the patients that might not have had the chance to read the, the bill or have someone help them understand it. And so they are thinking that what the transactions they are making are legal when in fact they're illegal and they are not jumping through those hurdles that Shane mentioned to get on the registry any longer. So the registry numbers are down for the first time since it began. Um, and it's just making it hard for our businesses to be able to project what we need going forward with these numbers fluctuating. Um, you know, one of the most important aspects of the medical marijuana program has been that we do have, uh, it's a by appointment only, therefore every appointment they're consulting with another individual it's acting as a lifeline to some patients. Um, they know that they can trust us, that people can talk to them about their ailments. Um, you know, sometimes they're not even purchasing the large amount. They're just in there to have a conversation. Uh, the Minimal Marrow Program um, still will have, you know, different products as addressed in S54 uh, than the adult use. And then we just have a few comments on the bill itself, all in uh, support of a few different areas um, that we think if this bill moves forward should should continue to be in it. The first is the qualifying medical conditions on page 35. Um, once adult use goes into effect, anyone over 21 can purchase cannabis. There's no reason why a patient's medical provider really shouldn't be able to refer them to a medical marijuana dispensary for medical use if they determine as the health care provider um, that this particular patient would benefit. I mean, if you're going to allow everyone in the state to purchase it, That's it, a good point. yeah, to have a list of qualifying conditions that a patient must um, have and the physician must attest to, it seems, well, it just seems like there's a conflict. Um, so, therefore, we do support the qualifying medical conditions language that includes other diseases, conditions, or treatment in, on page 35. Maybe <laughs> it's been hard to convince the other body that it's valued. We just thought we would get started by... Well, thank you for <laughs> noticing that. And then the allowable limit on page 37. Um, 
and it's basically due to the severity of some patients' illnesses, and I won't get into them. We've testified a few times on this. Um, we have patients that do need higher dosages, and the way that it's calculated in the medical marijuana program is not necessarily a gram to a gram of a concentrate. Um, so therefore, we do support increasing patients' allowable limits to three ounces. And um, the priority of licenses um, in Section 903A2, where the medical marijuana dispensaries have six years of experience in the cultivation, testing, and sales of cannabis in Vermont. Uh, therefore, the creation of a system of priorities, including uh, the applicants have existing medical cannabis dispensary license that's in good standing, have a you know, priority, is greatly appreciated by the medical cannabis program. Um, and then we do think that it's reasonable for the Cannabis Board to both regulate medical marijuana and adult use. Um, we think that the Board should look at the existing medical marijuana program rules and not alter them or, or diverge completely from them because then it would, again, drastically affect our businesses. Um, and perhaps additional language could be included in the bill that suggests that this Board um, can use that medical marijuana rules as a jumping off point to expand into adult use rules. Um, and, and that's it. So thank you for your consideration of these thoughts and um, letting us speak on the impact of the passage of the bill on July 1st to our um, operations. And we'd be happy to answer any questions. Do you see any conflict if you were to get a license, for example, to operate? a retail um, outlet for, you know, in one of the communities where you already have the medical. Would you, how would you do that if you were to? Well, so my focus has always been medical, so I think I'll let Shane answer that question, because okay. I think, you know, we, I think there are some people in the medical program that would just stay on the medical side okay. of it. I think we prioritize medical, making sure that medical patients uh, still receive the, you know, certain products, uh, certain uh, processes in coming into the store, priority in getting an appointment, priority in uh, dried flower selection, uh, back to the consultation services, making sure that none of the services that we currently provide are kind of eroded by that. Um, I think there's a benefit for us going into kind of this adult market in the sense that um, it, it economies of scales that will be afforded and I think some of that will actually benefit the medical program uh, in looking at certain places in Colorado uh, I've seen that with certain businesses and so um, I think it's a priority though the medical uh, program does survive uh, in the sense that we talk about different products, uh, but it's really the customer service. You know, College Street Beverage got mentioned uh, here, and you know, we, I, we don't want folks going into a College Street Beverage type place to, to buy their medicine. So well, the only advantage that you would have would be the no, non-tax. Well, we'd hope to. We'd hope there'd be more advantages uh, for the patients, at least. You know, for the patients. yeah. Obviously, you can serve somebody under twenty-one also. Hey, yeah. Um, and potentially larger amounts to purchase in the sense of, hey, maybe they do need a dose of, uh, of an edible that's above 10 milligrams, that they'd be able to purchase uh, that edible. Uh, a priority in coming in and setting an appointment would be another uh, area, uh, not having to wait in line, uh, that they would actually get to go to the front of the line if, if there was this opportunity to participate in adult market. So I think we want to find a way to make sure that people want to be a part of the medical program, because otherwise what we're seeing right now is people won't sign up. And that for us means that our, our six years of operations are going to potentially come to an end. I think we expected that in terms of allowing a home grow that people would need to tie their things from you anymore to, to grow at home and develop their own. But home delivery, all of that stuff is prominent? Uh, yeah, I would do that. Uh, you know. County or all over the state? I think it's all over the state. Uh, uh, you know, I grew up down in uh, Brattleboro, uh, and so I speak to people down in Brattleboro. I know that the community down there um, is very vibrant in what they're doing. Um, and I think the Seven Days article last night really just highlighted uh, what is occurring. And 
Uh, for me, I was kind of I started asking around about that, and, uh, and people say, "Oh yeah, that's been going on." I, I had no idea, uh, you know. And I've heard that there are uh, other places in Burlington that do the same. And so for us, it's that real urgency that there is a regulated program because of uh, you know, back to protecting the consumer. Uh, I think that's uh, uh, really important. Um, and there's only kind of one opportunity here as we move forward. Uh, and obviously, you're in support of that, so um, we support it as well. And, and I think, Senator Sears, that um, I, you know, I, heard, I heard you say that there is a bill and it's very clear what the laws are. I just think that the general public, there is some confusion, so they might not be thinking some of the transactions that they are doing are illegal when, in fact, they aren't permitted by the law that, that you all passed last year. And um, so there's just a lack of education going on um, for the general public on what is allowed and what is not allowed. I would agree, and also evidently, based upon the article and not a conversation with the mayor or the chief of police in Burlington, it looks like because it's not a priority for them, they haven't done anything about it. Um, that was what I gathered from the article. Sounded like they've known about it for quite a while. I think some of this is how to make a program that's going to be inclusive uh, for as many people so that you can uh, decrease the black market and looking at prohibition and recognizing that there's going to be a, you know, some awkwardness in this change. But I think uh, back to having an inclusive program, making sure you can get as many people into a regulated program to operate uh, is really important. I'd, I'd love to see if they get the guy for tax evasion. We do that for tax First thing that came to my mind was not paying taxes on all these sales. The Al Capone. Well, I argue for your one percent city sales tax. <laughs> What about that? Another, I, I bring up another issue for us is, you know, we have uh, roughly 70 employees at this point. You know, they have to have an FBI background check every year. Uh, and as this industry is growing here in the state, uh, we're, we're losing employees to the illegal market uh, and that there are businesses uh, starting up. Uh, and, you know, we lose employees to that marketplace because, again, they don't have to do the FBI, FBI background check. There are a whole bunch of things in there that allow them, uh, you know, being paid cash, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, you know, we, we're seeing the forces of this on, on multiple sides um, and really wanting to make sure the program sustains itself uh, for the long run uh, and appreciate any consideration to uh, adjusting the medical program this year. You heard the comments from, uh, regarding the social justice issue. Do you have any comments? Uh, I, I, it's real, uh, it, and I, I don't know how you navigate it, though. And, um, and I, so I guess I don't really have a, a solution or a suggestion on that, but it's, it's, um, it's definitely a concern. I think that's some of the tension right now, even, is the social, social justice of this. Uh, how do you arrest people? When you, part of this is that you're going to erase their, their uh, convictions, potentially, uh, or let them, uh, you know, or not be incarcerated, and yet, uh, last night uh, in the Seven Days article really highlights, though, that you know there's still laws, and for us, it's you know it's been six years of federally uh, breaking federal law, uh, and then the first years that was really scary, uh, and we didn't know what was going to happen, uh, and now we feel pretty confident, you know, that we follow the state laws, and that nothing's going to happen. But we've been following state laws, and we are very well regulated, and we find comfort in following those state laws, uh, and so back to. Last night's story again, yeah. just not even following state law. So I, I can imagine it's just difficult for law enforcement if you know conversations are happening that that will say we will take away a record um, for breaking a law, and yet there's a law right now. So why would you abide by it if if that's going to be erased? Well, the fact that the, the entire state is only eight people currently with some status. So none of them incarcerated <coughs> who are solely marijuana convictions. I don't know if you heard that, but, uh, Joe. Uh, I asked the corrections commissioner. Obviously, things can change day to day, but at the time that he responded, there were eight people who were solely on probation as a result of marijuana possession. Uh, three of them were below the two percent. A uh, two to two ounces. So 
the other five were above two ounces, so whatever that crime was, if they could. all eight were on probation, none incarcerated. Solely for marijuana? Solely for marijuana possession. But again, we don't know the one would have to assume that the five were well above, may have been well above the two ounces, and the, the other three, you know, we would look perhaps to where it is, something specific, maybe other charges were dropped. We don't know why they're on probation. So in the entire state, there's only three people on probation because that's a less than two ounces. Another thing for us, just back to highlighting some of the, the, the issues that we face, banking. Is always a concern, uh, and back to a regulated program really ensures that uh, our banking uh, uh, with, with Vermont Safe Play Credit Union is secure. They've increased their audits. It used to just be once a year. It's now going to be quarterly, uh, and so obviously they have federal requirements in their audit. And when they come and uh, review our books and talk to us, uh, and again back to uh, we still aren't able to borrow money from them. And so as this hemp thing does expand, I think it's really important that. Uh, there's a level playing field, and we all understand uh, what the rules are, um, because our concern is that we'll, we'll lose uh, certain services that are being provided to us uh, if these other companies aren't confident uh, in the marketplace in Vermont. And that goes to insurance as well, uh, and I think that's where, uh, again, uh, insurance companies that we deal with, the, the regulations are kind of an insurance for them to come into the state and offer uh, their products to us. So those those business aspects of uh, of this are are important. Other questions? Okay. Thank you very Thank much you. for coming in and updating us on on the use as well as updating on us on the conditions of the marijuana medical marijuana. Thank you. Um, the next witnesses maybe they're outside. I told them about eleven o'clock. So Commissioner Anderson and Commissioner Levine, are they out right outside? They were. Somebody check If they're not, we can start to carry them. You're a taxpayer. I'm here. You, you're, I'm ready to go. Okay. Right, well, we'll wait for them. Oh, no, I'll start outside. with tax. Uh, Nobody's out the door. Okay. Why don't we start with tax and then go to carry a payment and then we'll get our back. My fault for telling them that we didn't get them until 11. You never guess. We like the tax department. The tax department. I like the tax department too, so yeah, that's great. Doing a heck of a job. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Craig Bolio, the Deputy Commissioner for the Vermont uh, Department of Taxes. Uh, I had come and spoken to the committee last week and talked a little about the uh, subcommittee's recommendations, yeah. so I figured I would you know, just open it up to whatever you folks need to know. Well, I think the, the questions revolve around the subcommittees looking at the 20% the, the, Can you just remind us of what the subcommittee had proposed for the tax rate? Before? Sure. 20% 20, 20 right? Tw a 20% retail excise tax with the existing 6% sales tax on it, which would in turn uh, have the sales tax, local option tax for any jurisdictions that have that. And the, the 6% would go to the education fund? Correct. And the 20% would go to the, to the other functions of... That's right. And <clears throat> was there something about gross revenue going to the town? There was... No, there was. A, we had recommended that a share of the retail excise revenue would be shared with municipalities. Yeah. What do you think? Should we be sharing the revenue with town? I mean, how should we deal with towns? One percent is very small. You can leave it to the to the. Uh, Committee, the finance committee. Let's make a recommendation. Huh? Let's make a recommendation well, I, to I, them. I don't like what Mr. Abrams said. Yeah, about Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. that what, what they've done is they've allowed a 3% yeah. local option tax, and they get a certain amount of revenue. Right. And that they have to use that 
three percent for things related to the medical. The, you know, I think they can do three and three. Three and three. Right. So they get three percent. They can do anything with. Right. And they can additionally do three percent if they can show right. that they're putting it into actual effects. Right. You're right. Yeah. So they yeah. can get up to six. They can get up to six. Well, plus the fifty thousand dollars. Well, they I don't know. If it's right. <laughs> I don't can't imagine that the promoter would like that. We should specifically forbid that. Yes. Um, that and other things like the, uh, unless we do it with open eyes, the ten thousand dollars to a nonprofit. Those were things they just came up with yeah. on the fly. So, uh, so Massachusetts evidently has a system where it's different from. You want to open and get a license to operate at a retail establishment in X town. What's happened is they asked for a donation to the local. One town was ten thousand dollars to the uh, to some local nonprofit. Yeah, I think those so are the host community agreements. The host community yeah. agreement, and that's what we're talking about. That standing. Yeah, I mean, I think really for us, part of the question was, what's the right level of funding, and then what's the right way to get it there? Mm -hmm. um, and we had in the subcommittee, we did talk about a local option tax. Um, there's some complexity that can come with a local option tax as well. So it seemed it, it, it may be a simpler mechanism to just do revenue sharing. It's certainly easier for the tax department uh, to simply distribute a share of the revenue than to administer a local option tax. But if we think that's the more effective path. Um, we administer a local option tax now, but that, that's really where much of the uh, subcommittee's recommendation came from. It, it seems like the local option tax, I mean, if, if the shop opens and then it closes, it seems like there's going to be a lot of work if there's a lot of change going on, with, not, with the, not with them collecting it, but if you're doing it and distributing it to them. Um, I, the complexity comes more in terms of when the, the extra towns come on and some towns choose to do it, some don't. I mean, some of the complexity that exists with sales and use tax may not exist with this, right? One of the, the biggest complexities we see with, with sales taxes is, is deliveries, right? And uh, if you're on a town line and what, what, what zip code are you really in? Do you really owe the local option tax to this town or that town? Um, that's where a lot of the, the challenges come in with, with administering that. And it's, and it's a challenge both for the department and for folks operating uh, th those businesses. Quick question, I guess, for Michelle. Um, in terms of an opt-out, what what is the interaction and in time between when the bill would go into effect and when a community would need to opt out? Because I could imagine a community lagging a little bit, and then suddenly businesses start up before they've had a chance to consider it. Is that part of the timeline? Uh, <laughs> the, so the section that allows the municipalities to do the opt-out would take effect in July 1st of this year along with uh, I'll, I'll double check. But um, uh, as Senator Sears has mentioned uh, a few times, that there's a kind of a long rollout before mm -hmm. we would actually start seeing any type of retail sales. So they'd have um, a year or two. And so, yes. And so they would hold either, uh, they would uh, put on the ballot at their March election or they could hold a special election to opt out. Um, but I would say, you know, I'll look at the timeline, but I think if they would have the opportunity to have two March elections mm -hmm. down, you know, uh, before there would actually be retail sales, so they'd have the opportunity to opt out. I'd like to see made clear that there are no host community agreements private. Um, I, I just think that was kind of unseemly. And secondly, um, ask the Finance Committee to look at shared revenue, gross revenue, with the, uh, I guess it would be the tax revenue, the tax, yep. with the communities rather than a local option tax. And then finally, the zoning issue. Um, I would hate to see a community zone them out. Would that be allowed? Um, well, it talks about their Which is essentially, we're trying to get around the 
vote by yeah. basically just making it so difficult that nobody could operate. And I think, let me look and see how we can well, some language. Since the Winooski, that came up because we were dealing sure. with uh, different zones where sex offenders could reside. People that were on the sex offender registry. And there was a push to have a not living within a certain distance of the school, daycare center, or playground, and which would effectively mean that would have meant no matter what yard you put down, nobody would ever be able to live in Minuski who's on the sex offender registry. And that might have been good for Minuski, but not good for Colchester or other surrounding people who were already there and living in their own, own home and yeah, regulation, which, which happened to people. Right. So it was in other states. Happened here. Well, in, here. in Rutland. Right? In Rutland. Yeah. Yeah. That well, was a local was, ordinance. What about the adult bookstore? Is that the same? I mean, towns can, I thought they were required to be able to have, be able to allow them in, but you could put them wherever you want. So in Ludlow, you put them in the industrial park. So, I mean, is that the same? I think it's, a, it's the same thing, but same since thing. I typically don't work on the land use issues, yeah. I'll check with the archivists who do and see. And my guess is that this issue, is, as you said, mentioned, has come up in other contexts yeah. where basically, you know, they want to make sure that the will of the General Assembly isn't subverted by, you know, by going around and doing, making it so hard in other ways through the local permitting system that you can operate. So I'll, I'll check back. Are there any other questions for the commission? Uh, well, so we did ask for uh, additional staffing um, as part of the uh, the report. Let me pull the numbers up. Um, it was sort of a ramp up, um, and there's there's a couple of things that we would need. One, we'd need uh, to code our software, which has a cost to it. Um, we use uh, the same tax software that Massachusetts uses, so we've been in discussions with them and the company. Um, so we, we believe that that cost would be about $1.5 million to put in the software to be able to process the tax. Um, without some changes to, um, or, or really some, some guarantees that we'd be able to, to have banking, um, that's a big concern for the tax department as well, that our building is not currently equipped to handle cash. So um, we, we looked at, uh, we scaled some estimates back from the state of Washington and think that it would cost about a million dollars to, to outfit our building to be able to take cash. Um, and then there was, there was a couple of staff positions asked for in the lead up, um, policy analysts and, and a business analyst to help with the installation of the software. Um, and then a handful of, of tax examiners, I think two tax examiners um, for front end processing. Those are customer service staff that help with processing returns and answering phone calls. And then um, some, some discovery and audit staff as well. So maybe three. I think. Uh, I think ultimately, we the ask is uh, was five or six staff for that uh, would be for all of it. Everything for the tax department. Uh, well, it depends on what time frame you're asking for, right? Because the lead up, I think, um, is, is is probably in the neighborhood of of between two and a half and three million. That's for the software, the building construction, and then the initial uh, staff members, and then after that. Um, probably about 700000 a year with the staff and any kind of ongoing maintenance and things we would need like that for the building. Um, so the, the idea here is the commission would recommend the fees that would cover that. Mm -hmm. but let's say this bill passed. And what would you need immediately? Before the fees are established and so forth. Yeah, I, th I it think. Would be like, as I envision it, it would be like a loan. Yep. Yeah. You know, from one budget item to the next. I think prior to retail, we estimated about $1.6 million. So that would be half of the software cost, as well as doing the construction efforts for the building. And we could pay another part of the uh, software cost after uh, the retail sales so began. Can you email um, those? Absolutely. Yep. The upfront cost. That's right, yep. Yeah, and then the fees would eventually cover that. We have a full breakdown that says, like, prior to retail, one, two, and three. I'll just send you the whole thing, and I'm happy to answer any questions that come up from that. Okay. 
any other questions? Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Commissioner will be. Oh, I know one other question. Could you look into how many people have actually been? Something like the story of seven days. Is there any, ever, anybody gone after for tax evasion? I'm sorry, say again. Seven days last night had a story about a, a person who's selling marijuana out of the store in Burlington. Yep. Does anybody ever go after the taxes? I can't tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, we, we do, do we have the ability to go after taxes? Yeah, and it's operating in a legal business. Um, we can, um, but uh, often that's in, that's in uh, conjunction with you know the attorney general's office and, and DPS as well. Because we don't have our own criminal division. Uh, and, but often in a situation like that, uh, you know, a hypothetical where somebody is operating a business that's paying no taxes, that's often an IRS problem as well, and they have. Uh, a very large criminal division. Okay. Commissioner. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank Health you. Commissioner Mark Levine. I presume you'd like me to make some opening comments and yeah, then take some questions. Uh, I'd like to just draw everyone's attention to two documents. One is the recommendations of the Prevention and Education Subcommittee that I led for the Marijuana Advisory Commission that the governor uh, appointed. Um, and I will not reiterate everything in the yeah. report, but I will call out some highlights. And the second document is uh, the health impact assessment that the health department did several years ago regarding marijuana and updated a year ago. Um, and I call your attention to that because this is an area that lots of uh, ideas and sometimes supposed evidence gets thrown around, um, but um, I believe our health impact assessment plus a subsequent document by the National Academy of Medicine um, really did uh, look in a very critical way to try to separate fact from, not necessarily fiction, but fact from areas where we still don't have a resolution in our knowledge, whether it be with regard to the benefits of THC, cannabis, whether it be to harms. Um, so I just uh, invite you to, uh, in your deliberation, during your deliberations, review some of that material. Uh, so I'm gonna make a number of bullet points, so I know your schedule is rather cramped. Uh, first, uh, is to state that we already have a significant public health problem with regard to marijuana uh, in our youth. And the governor appointed this committee and commission uh, with one major goal in mind, amongst others, which was to protect the most vulnerable and protect youth. So usage rates in our uh, middle and high school populations that we obtained from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey um, have actually shown an alarming increase in current use amongst those youth. They also continue to show a problem we have experienced with e-cigarettes and with alcohol, which is a low perception of harm. Um, and these youth are able to discern harm because almost 70% uh, of them agree that smoking cigarettes might be bad for your health. Um, they learned that message well. Um, but they're way down in the 30% when it comes to these other substances. So when you pair a low perception of harm with a high usage rate, uh, you can anticipate problems. I would um, invite you again to look at the health impact assessment uh, in regard to that. Uh, but one of the major conclusions of our committee uh, has been all along that there's a significant uh, potential for deleterious effect on youth. Second item is um, cannabis or THC, depending on what you'd like to use, um, would actually be called in the lingo of public health a substance, and that substance misuse can't be siloed. Substance misuse is really uh, across the spectrum 
and any strategies one uses for prevention and to improve people's health with regard to the use of such substances um, will generally work across substances. You don't need a specific one for opioids, a specific one for marijuana, et cetera. And for the most part, these prevention strategies have a very robust evidence base. And um, it's not like we have to uh, invent the wheel. We can actually do some very well-proven strategies. And it's also quite clear uh, from the evidence that substance misuse prevention works best when it's comprehensive and when it is sustained. As a health commissioner and as a physician, obviously I have in previous forums voiced some of my concerns uh, about uh, the substance that we're talking about today. Um, I just want to call out the fact that if one looks at recent literature, even since the commission met, which just was a couple months, um, there are growing uh, reports, growing consensus, uh, and more abundant literature about deleterious effects on the developing brain. And in this case, we're talking about anyone who's an adolescent up to age 25 for a developing brain. And the specific thing is mental health. Uh, and to get even more specific, uh, both acute and chronic forms of psychosis. Um, and these are quite profound. They're quite well documented in literature. The relationship is quite firm now. And the, the rates are alarming. Another thing I'd like to mention is that states who have an experience already with uh, systems that might tax and regulate and certainly have legalized uh, cannabis, um, generally, when you talk to them after the fact, they say that they had nothing in advance for prevention that was really set up very well, no funding for anything for prevention in advance. And it took them longer than a year or two to make this a more robust program of prevention. Um, and that uh, they all regret. I mean, it was a fact of life. Uh, they all had to make up for lost time. And they all stated a need for 5 to $10 million minimum uh, to engage in those activities, none of which was available in the early uh, pre-years or years. Um, and uh, when we ask them, you know, what could you advise us as a state that's now uh, potentially going to follow in your footsteps, one of the key uh, lessons learned, if you will, was going to be uh, have something set up in advance and uh, be able to handle uh, protecting youth brains early in the process, not retrospectively. There's very impressive data from Colorado and some other states regarding other um, things that get underplayed um, in some of the uh, newspapers or what have you, but certainly come out quite prominently. And that's the rates of young people, even infants, uh, appearing in medical settings, especially emergency rooms, uh, with a pediatric overdose emergency. Um, these are not only linked to a specific form of cannabis, but certainly edibles has been the one in the infant part that, or the toddler part, I should probably say, that, that has been of most concern. Um, the other data that comes out that I'll defer to my public safety colleagues is in the traffic safety data and in the rates of uh, vehicular accidents and deaths. And these, from a public health nor public safety standpoint, can, can be ignored. You may be aware, if you've read the Commission's uh, overall report, that there were one or two areas where we could not gain consensus. The one area I'd like to call out at this testimony is the area of edibles. And uh, well beyond the Education and Prevention Committee, there were numerous committee members, commission members, who uh, came out on the side of we should not have edibles. They represent too potentially dangerous a substance to have. Even when uh, all of the precautions which we list in our uh, subcommittee report are taken in terms of making sure they don't look like candy bars, they don't look like 
brownies that are packaged in a way that youth would be uh, attracted to them, et cetera. So we still feel that that's a very, very uh, compelling literature behind medical consequences of use of edibles. It was pointed out to us that that might be shooting oneself in the foot if one was designing a tax and regulate system because people might obtain them from the black market or from other states or what have you, uh, and that you would be taking a significant portion of your revenue stream out of the stream. Uh, and examining this, looking at Colorado data, there was about 10 to 15 percent of total sales were in the edible form. So it certainly wasn't the majority of what was being purchased, though when total sales are quite high, that's still a lot of money, obviously. So we uh, still come out pretty much categorically against uh, inclusion of edibles in any kind of tax and regulated system. The thing I'd like to spend my last um, moment on that is of most concern uh, is the fact that legislation as it's currently written uh, does not really have any funding uh, included for the area of prevention. Uh, needless to say, that's what public health is all about, is prevention. That's what my comments have all been geared towards. And we believe it would be uh, not only unacceptable, but unconscionable to have legislation that would uh, create this kind of potential marketplace that would not at least make an effort explicitly to have a revenue stream going towards education and prevention and research, and that would not uh, formally, if you will, and explicitly protect public health and public safety. I don't, I will, if you ask questions, uh, go through some of the specific prevention strategies, but they're all in our report. They're very well-founded strategies. Um, much like any strategy, whether you're talking about uh, tobacco abuse or alcohol use, uh, they do come with a price tag. Uh, some of them are purely messaging type strategies, which are effective. I call them necessary, but not sufficient, because they will not get you the mileage you need other than uh, putting things on people's radar screens. However, there are plenty of strategies that involve school-based curricula, uh, substance abuse professionals within school systems, community partnerships that are called prevention, regional prevention partnerships, models like the Iceland model, which has been called out quite frequently uh, during our proceedings in the Marijuana Commission, that combine a community activation piece, a parental buy-in and investment piece, and a youth voice piece to creating after school and other activities for youth so that during that most dangerous time in their lives, between, six, uh, between 3 and 6 p.m., uh, they're engaging in uh, healthy activities, uh, strengthening activities, character building activities, and not uh, potentially getting into trouble with substances or other activities. Thank you. Um, just to respond briefly to the fact that there's nothing in here. Sure. About decision that was not made lately by the six sponsors, the six main sponsors, and then we had a group of other co-sponsors. We talked a lot about how to deal with both traffic safety issues as well as the um, prevention and health-related issues. Uh, we decided that those should be separate bills, that, uh, just as the the House passed a separate bill last year regarding traffic safety. Um, and certainly, we, you know, there may be a push to, towards the end to add it to the bill. We, as introducing the bill, decided to keep that issue of how you would spend the money to the appropriation process. Um, and part of the thinking was that we already have the problem. It's not like Regular taxing and regulating this makes this problem go away. And I, it, testimony, just, I'll just read from the testimony of um, the folks from the uh, Cannabis Trades Association, which is the medical side. Yeah. And their concern, what happens if we legalize the black July 1st. Significantly increased competition from the unregulated and illegal market 
the unregulated and illegal market is now the largest competitor throughout the state, selling flowers, edibles, <laughs> and so forth, and developing brands in preparation for tax and regulated market. Black market delivery services are also prominent. There appears to be confusion among patients and home growers as to the legality of the transactions. Therefore, you can find a lot of product on the streets. So, quite frankly, and before we did that last January, the problem was tonight, last July, whenever we passed the legalization. So, I, I would absolutely support some of the prevention pieces that you just talked about as a member of the Appropriations Committee. Um, and hopefully they're in the governor's budget. Because the problem is here this year, it's not going to change in 18 months if this law becomes effective. It's not automatically going to change. I understand that once it's legalized, we just talked to a select board member from Great Barrington, Mass, whose main concern was, okay, people are driving here to buy the product. Where do they use it? Particularly if they're from New York, Connecticut, Vermont. Mm -hmm. you know, obviously, they're right. So, that you know, that's a that's a concern that happens when you open a retail sale. But as we know from last night's story, in seven days, um, retail sales have already started. So that's that's why, I know, um, I'm and I welcome a conversation with the Health and Welfare Committee or any other committee or the or in the House if they want to add something to it. If we pass this, I'm not I'm not opposed to. I suspect it's up. <laughs> I, I, I'm wondering about the figures, though. What do you need immediately? The figures, did you say? What do you need right now for funding so, to do yeah. what you feel? Mm -hmm. and assuming that for a moment this bill passes, and yep. sales become effective what April 1, 2021? April, April yep. let's just say April, mm -hmm. April of 2021, actual retail sales become legal in Vermont. <coughs> that's about yep. as quick as we think we could do it. What do you need between now and then? That's the question. Six to eight million dollars. And where would we? We're not selling any product. We're not. We don't have. Right. So that becomes the problem. All the other states have. Right. Where do I, where, do, where does the appropriation process find six to eight million dollars mm -hmm. in the front of the Department of Health? Another. Right. Well, hopefully, there's a lot of surplus funds this year. Rather than paying off teacher retirement. Well, I think it's important to point out, and Dr. I, I appreciate your work. Uh, it was a pleasure working with all of you on the commission. The original intent was to roll this out in such a way so that funds were generated prior to the actual retail sales. That didn't happen for reasons that are beyond all of our control now. Mm -hmm. But we have the additional problem of the states and the country surrounding us making this all the more critical to get hold of some kind of regulated scheme as quickly as possible. So I, I just want to assure you from I my perspective, and I suspect mm -hmm. that all the committee members, that we are cognizant of the problem and we're trying to get our hand on it as quickly as possible. But hopefully we can still design something that rolls out money coming through that need first prior to getting any further steps down the road. It's a no, and I was on the commission with you, and I appreciate that. Uh, I, I do just want to again call out the fact that uh, whether we like it or not, our, our youth are different than the youth in the surrounding states when it comes to their rates of usage, when it comes to their perception of harm. Um, so we, we're sort of earlier in the curve in terms of the problems. Right. Uh, that we're I had understood when I first got involved in this conversation probably five years ago that Vermont youth were ranking at the top, if not at the top, 
very close to the top in consumption per capita. Yeah. And that has been an ongoing problem. And I can see that there are numbers increasing. The reports are clearly indicating that. Uh, but I think it's all the more important that we get hold of this in a regulated scheme somehow, as opposed to ignoring it or trying to Understood. back to prohibition. Senator for I'm, I'm wondering, I understand six to eight million already indicates that it's a it's a range and it's not perfectly specific, but yeah. when you think about that amount of money, where do you think of it plugging it in prior to the rollout of uh, sales? Mm -hmm. So like what exact activities? Yeah, so some of it is in messaging campaigns. A big chunk of it is in um, school-based uh, prevention activities. Um, and uh, development of what we call these regional prevention partnership networks, which are um, actually designed to be community and regional specific, because not every part of Vermont is like every other part of Vermont. And they have a proven track record of actually being able to adapt the kinds of prevention programming and activities to the needs of that specific portion of the state. You, you cited the Deerfield Valley. Yes. That, the kids from Twin Valley are actually here today. I'm supposed to meet them at quarter of 12 to 12 to 15 mm -hmm. in the cafeteria. So they, actually they have. They have a great story to tell. Yeah. 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 Yes. I just thought it put a plug for good school in my district. <laughs> No, it's today. That's a different group. Oh, okay. The same school, but they want to testify on something else. Okay. Really so. <laughs> They're here today. I don't know why they come up so often. That's right. <laughs> Probably as far away from the, from the uh, Montpelier as you can be and still be in Vermont. They're going to actually uh, uh, waiting hand is the location of the high school. They're far right on the border from that. And the cool to take a road trip. What should we do on the Yeah, well, we can take a road trip down there. Meet them halfway. Anyway, I, I digress. No, but that's a perfect yeah, example of yeah, one of those things that we want to set up more statewide. Well, it might be helpful either to the Health and Welfare Committee or to the Appropriations Committee to have your uh, $6 million to $8 million plan, what you would need in this year's budget. Absolutely. That is already in your book. Right. Yeah, I mean, I don't mean to take the eight billion from someplace else. Yeah. Is there any federal funds involved? In, in your six to eight there, there are federal funds involved in pre existing health care associated messaging campaigns, et cetera. Yeah. But in this kind of money we're talking for this specific yeah, effort, dollars. we're not talking yeah. federal yeah. dollars. That's right. Okay. Other questions for the commissioner? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is Commissioner Anderson from the Department of Public Safety. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. So I wasn't quite sure how you wanted to proceed, but I've got a statement I can read, uh, answer questions, and then we can go from there. Uh, Tom Anderson, Commissioner of Public Safety. Uh, this is with respect to S54. As this committee considers the wisdom of creating a legal commercial market for the recreational use of marijuana, I hope part of your consideration will be for the majority of Vermonters that don't use and have no interest in using marijuana or any other drug as part of their, quote, recreational pursuits. Uh, their voices seem to have been forgotten in this debate. The governor has made pretty clear that addressing roadway safety and issues related to, to prevention and education for our kids about the dangers of marijuana are critically important. On July 1st, 2018, Vermont became the ninth state to legalize recreational marijuana. It is yet too soon to tell what effects legalization 
will have on our children or the health and well-being and an overall character of the state? Why would we not want to wait uh, to know those answers before charging ahead with full commercialization? What we do know, as Dr. Levine just pointed out, is there growing, there's a growing body of evidence that marijuana is really bad for our kids and that youth usage is likely to go up after legalization. We also know that drivers impaired by opioids, cocaine, marijuana, and other drugs pose a threat to every Vermonter and visitor that drive our highways. We further know that evidence coming from other states that have legalized recreational marijuana strongly suggests that Vermonter, more Vermonters will die on our highways should Vermont continue down the path of commercial legalization. The data from Vermont is equally alarming. In Vermont, marijuana was decriminalized in 2013. In the three-year period pre- and post-decriminalization, there was a 28% increase for all motor vehicle crashes where at least one driver tested positive for marijuana. For crashes resulting in a fatality, the increase was over 30%. This month, AOT released preliminary statistics for deaths on Vermont roads in 2018. Last year, 68 people lost their lives in fatal motor vehicle crashes. This compares with 70 deaths in 2017 and 64 deaths in 2016. A particularly disturbing trend for the past two years is that the number of, the number of drug impaired drivers involved in fatal motor vehicle crashes. For the past two years, by a more than two to one margin, fatal crashes involving a driver suspected of driving under the influence of only drugs has eclipsed the number of drivers impaired by alcohol. That's a two to one margin. Equally disturbing is that 23 of the 68 fatalities, over one third, involve drivers impaired by drugs alone or a combination of drugs and alcohol. Of these 23 drug, drug impaired or drug and alcohol impaired fatalities, 65% of the drivers tested positive for Delta 9 THC, the main psychoactive ingredient, psychoactive ingredient in marijuana. Perhaps it's only coincidence that this trend in marijuana related fatalities mirrors Vermont's push to make marijuana legal and more available for legal sales. Or perhaps it's a wake-up call for Vermonters that what the future holds once marijuana is widely available. More fatal crashes killing more and more Vermonters. That has clearly been the experiences of Colorado and Washington after they legalized the retail sale of marijuana, in addition to the increased marijuana use by teenagers. As legislation for the commercialization of marijuana is considered, priority number one for legislators, both pro and anti-legalization, should be to protect our children and ensure the motoring public is protected from irresponsible individuals who take drugs and then get behind the wheel of a car. How can this be done? First, by ensuring there are robust prevention and education programs for our youth. Second, by enacting legislation that allows for the collection and testing of oral fluid from those suspected of driving under the influence of drugs. Scientific studies show that saliva testing is reliable and provides important evidence for prosecutors and juries. 14 states, Australia and several European countries have approved some form of oral fluid testing to help keep roadways safe. And both the Governor's Marijuana Advisory Commission and the Opioid Coordination Council supports this important legislation. As the 2018 motor vehicle fatality statistics make clear, drivers impaired by marijuana and other drugs pose a growing threat to every Vermonter and visitor who drive our highways. The passage of legislation permitting the commercial sale of marijuana, this legislative session without addressing roadway safety, and appropriate protection for our kids would be a disservice to all Vermonters. Finally, laws are, impacted, are, are enacted for the public good and because they further important public policy goals. Before enacting this legislation, every single legislature should ask themselves what public policy goals are being furthered by this legislation, including one, does the legislation protect the welfare of our children and youth? Two, does the legislation place any Vermonter at risk of injury or death? And three, does this legislation promote the overall health and well-being of Vermonters? If the answer to any of these questions is no, then a yes vote on this legislation is difficult to justify. Happy to answer any questions, sir. Thank you. Do you have copies of your testimony? Or uh, I can provide you the right copies. And Dr. Levine, if you have your opening remarks, if you can send them to Peggy, you'd like to have them on the record. If, if, if you I, have I, I, I can send them. I can email them to you. Yeah, if you could, that would be helpful to have them on the record so we can post them on the committee. Um, I mean, I, you and I have talked yeah. ad nauseum about this issue of roadside testing. I'm sure we will continue that conversation. I'm sure we'll continue the conversation whether the bill passes or doesn't pass or uh, 
until I'm no longer here or you're no longer here. <laughs> uh, but I, I was interested in a statement from the governor of Rhode Island, who's now supporting this, but she said basically what you just said. But I'm also interested in Massachusetts, which is looking at how do we deal with this oral fluid issue. And my understanding is the commissioner commission there is looking to how can we get electronically a search warrant to take an oral fluids test as quickly as possible to the officer at the scene of the stop. And I don't know how quickly it can be done. I haven't talked with Judge Grissom uh, about it. I don't know how quickly it could be done in Vermont, but your officer has reason to believe the person driving impaired, of course you can't stop anybody unless you have reason to believe they are. Correct. Or they don't use the turn signal, which, uh, by the way, or don't stop at a stop sign like Representative Morrison this morning. I've got to speak to her <laughs> driving me. Um, but anyway, uh, <laughs> Needless to say, if somebody does something and you stop them and you have reason to believe they're impaired, you can then ask for certain tests. Um, and I'm just curious as to if there's any thought about that as being kind of a middle ground between where you and I seem to be and how quickly could the officer receive that search? I, I take a look and just briefly the, at the Massachusetts legislation. I think there is some sort of warrant requirement that they they were looking at on that, with, without conceding that a warrant is even needed for oral fluid, which I would argue that it's not. Um, you know, the, the, the process of setting up a process in place to get a warrant for oral fluid. Um, I'm not sure. I'd have to give that a little bit of thought and, and look at you know what, what the process would be to get it more quickly. I mean, we, we can get a warrant for blood now. Right. So the idea that I need to get a warrant for, or I'd, I'd go to oral fluid when I can already do that by getting a warrant for blood, um, I'm not sure where that would where that would fall at this point. Well, but, I'm just interested in what, you know, we're looking at how Massachusetts is. Yeah, I'll, I'll look at that, Senator. So what they're proposing is to what the mechanism would be to get an oral warrant and how that, you know, those get tricky because you have to make a record of it. Uh, Presumably, it's doing it right over your cell phone. Right, it's, it's creating the... It's creating the records so they can be looked at after the fact by, you know, what's a probable cause. You know, it's, it's, the, it's the creating the record and, and how you do that, and which becomes a little bit. I mean, the devil's always in the details. Yeah. And, you, and you said something about juries looking you know, at the information, give more information to the jury. Wouldn't that already paint the jury if there was, there's no evidence that the person was impaired from the, from the amount? We don't have an impairment amount for marijuana. Kind of well, we don't have an impairment amount with blood either, but we're allowed to take that by statute. Blood doesn't tell you anything. No, the oral fluid's not going to tell you anything that blood doesn't tell you. It simply tells you the presence of the drug in the person. And as we've talked about many times, in my view, it's just another piece of evidence jurors ought to be able to look at. Let me just make clear about the difference between blood and the oral fluid. You, can take, you can't really take blood from a person right at the scene of the, at the car. You know, you've got to go somewhere to take the blood. I don't think you want your state police officer to take the blood at the scene of the, no. at the, scene of the stop. I have to train them all as phlebotomists. So, right. if I want to do so that. yeah. Um, so I, I think what you, what I was talking about with oral fluid, the difference would be one could take that at the scene yeah. once they had the blood. Right. Which obviously, you know, the officer could do that, but they might not be able to take no, and I, I guess my point was the blood, the two, the two so tests. Look at, as, you, as we look at this issue, yeah. um, I'd like to understand. I know what your preference would be, but. I, I'm, I'm happy to take a look at it. I just, oral fluid's going to tell you the same thing blood tells you. It doesn't, as you, you've well, indicated, it doesn't give you any. You can't, you can't take the blood at the scene, but you can take the oral fluid at the scene. Right. But at the end of the day, the evidence I'm getting is the same. There's a yeah. presence of a drug in the person. In the person. It's the same evidence. Yeah. So. So, so I thought once you took the second, not the, the first swab would be just to be pre determine presence of. It's a screening mechanism. That's right. And if nothing is there, then they throw that out and get you. But the second one would be the evidence, if I understand this right. And so if that could be taken at the scene, there's not going to be the determination there. It's going to go to the lab, right? Correct. I mean, the lab would then test that and give you right. a qualitative and quantitative analysis of it. 
of the salon. So that would be the valuable part. If it came back, again, there's, a, there's additional evidence. I mean, it would be right. just another yes, piece yes, of evidence right, along with all the other evidence. Fairly concrete. Yeah. So the concern is, could you take it up the second one at the scene? That's what you'd like. Well, to that's do. what I I'm understand. saying. Well, they, they would collect that at the scene. So, so for example, let's say we had a regime where you could you could you could have uh, a preliminary screening test that tested positive. You would then take the evidentiary swab right. shortly thereafter. Maybe it's back at the barracks if you go through the apply well, process. Going back to the barracks. My thought. Yeah. My thought. Do it on the scene. What evidently what Massachusetts is looking at. This isn't my genius, by the way. This reading in the Boston Globe about what Massachusetts is saying. So, <clears throat> officers at the scene, there's a stop. He, has, he or she have reason to believe that the operator is driving impaired. Maybe, you know, what, yeah. for whatever. They write that down, apply for a, a search warrant, goes to a judicial officer who then approves it or disapproves it. And if the if the judicial officer approves it, they could take the swab right there at the scene. They wouldn't have to wait for hours or whatever. You know. and I don't know how quickly we could do it in the bond. I, I haven't talked to Judge Griffin, as I said. It might not even work, but I'm saying that this is kind of, for me, a judicial officer has made the determination that this is something that, you know, that there is probable cause. They found that. And they, they've allowed a search warrant with any search. What would be the uh, potential circumstances under which the judicial officer would deny the search warrant? In other words, a, a police officer says, I observe this behavior. Well, he's writing it down. Understood, but, but uh, in other words, does the judge have anything other than the the officer's word that he thinks, you know, I mean, usually a search warrant, you have to come up with more than just we think. Right. You, have, you have to have, under Vermont law, it's impaired to the slightest degree, not impaired big time. So it, you, you would have to, I believe that because this person was weaving in and out of traffic, because the person hit three cars, that the person was driving impaired. Mm -hmm. These are the facts, and you would write them down, and then that would be what the judge would determine. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, it's like the, the stop in Bennington by the Bennington chief who um, thought he smelled marijuana, uh, asked the guy to stop, wanted to get a search warrant to search the vehicle, and he had a couple of other officers there, and the guy drove off getting the the chief of police, luckily he wasn't injured, but they did stop him later and found eight pounds of marijuana. So he didn't wait for a problem. You know, he'd already done something wrong by trying to flee. But, yeah. I, I, you know, what's that? But uh, warrants are often issued based on the officers who's under oath, you know, testifying as to what they saw or what they did, and the judge makes a determination whether it's probable cause to issue the warrant. I mean, that's no, I understand. I'm just, I'm just wondering, <laughs> pro forma, and we're just going to set up a, a system in which every request is, is uh, agreed with. It calls into question the need or the efficacy of the system itself. Well, the idea is it's a neutral and detached magistrate that's looking at the looking at the evidence and making an independent determination. Right, but but if the only evidence is the evidence of offered by the officer, it's hard to get neutrality because. But, but that's, well, that's what happens. That's, that happens all the time, every day. Um, and the judge would make the determination based on the law whether those facts establish probable cause. You could have a situation where the judge says, "Look, I just don't think that's probable cause." Well, you do have the cruiser cam that is providing a kind of. Theoretically neutral. Well, Representative Morris, he went through a stop sign, <laughs> rolling through a stop sign in front of Senator Sears, who was coming in the other direction. And Representative Morris, he, um, if somebody had stopped her and said, You went through that stop sign, and then I had reason to believe she was driving impaired, they'd have to have some kind of, besides the fact she rolled through the stop sign, there'd have to be something to indicate that she was impaired. To the slightest degree. And those often get hotly contested in the middle of a, you know, middle of a criminal case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Senator Benning then would argue on behalf of Representative Morrissey that she was in a rush to get to a meeting. No, but I, if she got out of the car and was asked to perform food sobriety tests, she would have a problem with doing that. So there's an implication there right off the bat that she's guilty, and that's where I'm having trouble. Trouble with what? Trouble with what? Trying to design a system where we have probable cause enough to get a warrant. I think the answer to your question. In that set of circumstances, the judge could ask a question. Do you smell marijuana? Mm -hmm. If the answer is no, would the judge then give permission to take the saliva test? I don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. The officer would testify or say, say to the judge, these are the observations of the vehicle. Asked her to step out, perform field sobriety tests. She couldn't perform the field sobriety tests. Now, you and I know what her physical limitations are, because we see her in this building every day. Does that then give the judge enough ammunition on a warrant request to say, go ahead and have a saliva test? Um, as a defense attorney, I would argue no, but that's, Tom is right, we would get into a battle with the court system over whether that should happen or not. Anyhow, yeah. you'd probably get in a battle if we allowed it to be done without <coughs> Once, you know, once the officer brought that evidence in, I'm sure that no matter which way you did it, it would be a battle for that evidence sure. you know, legitimately obtained. Other questions for Commissioner Anderson? I don't want to. Well, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Our final witness of the day, with all due respect to you know, I, Facebook every now and then shows you a picture from way back when. And this morning, it was three years ago, I was on, you can quote me today, we were filming it with Anson Tebbets, <laughs> who is not here today. I was, but just let Anson know that I saw him this morning from three years ago. I will. I will. Um, for the record, Carriage Garrett, Agency of Agriculture. And um, I didn't prepare this for this committee, but uh, since it came up, here's a here's a little one pager with some other details about the hemp program. Mm -hmm. And um, Sorry. anyway, did you hear the testimony? So 50% of your, so you don't have, why don't you start to do your testimony and then answer that question about 50%? We'll, we'll cover the hemp first. And, okay. and so there's a lot of debate about how hemp is defined in the Farm Bill. And it specifically says 0.3% uh, Delta 9 THC. And I wanted to go worst case scenario. Um, in Vermont just to see what some of these crops were going to produce. And the plant itself doesn't produce or produces very little Delta 9 THC. It's all THCA. And the Farm Bill also specified uh, that the crop be tested at a dry matter basis. And uh, we at our lab, not all labs do, um, interpret that to be 0% moisture. Um, so when you take a hemp plant and dry it down to 0% moisture, convert all the THCA um, into Delta 9, mathematically after the test you get a number. And that number on about 50% of the hemp crop was less than 1%, but um, above 0.3. There were a lot of 0.39, a lot of 0.42, um, 0.6 I think was the highest. Um, so taxonomically, they were growing hemp, but um, to fit the strict federal definition, they would not have. Um, some states are proposing to just look at uh, 0.3 Delta 9 on a growing crop, and that will make everything, every cannabis plant in the state uh, hemp by definition. Um, even the crop the dispensaries are growing tested right off the shelf isn't going to have a 0.3 delta 9. So that's not the definition we want to go with. Um, some other states are proposing to go with that definition. Um, 
we're looking to, to split the hair somewhere in the middle. If your total theoretical is less than 0.1 and the delta 9 is below 0.3, I think we can taxonomically call that crop hemp. Um, that said, you also saw the, the Digger article and, and some of the other news uh, outfits reporting that folks taking just CBD do test positive uh, with a urine test for THC. And I believe that uh, even at the point three, if it is, if it is um, below point three, you still will test, test positive on a urine test. We don't regulate the CBD, CBD Correct. oils, right? We do. We do. do we so this is Senator Rogers' bill last year. Uh, as of July, yes. Um, so they're reg they're tested by you. Yeah. So right now we're we're at half staff or half capacity with our lab since Irene has been up at UVA. Where we've developed, we got authority to create the cannabis quality control program last year through Senator Rogers' bill, um, and we have um, been testing similar, all the same components that were in 241. So, a cannabinoid component, a pesticide residue, solid residue, molds and mildews. If there's a store in Bennington selling CBD oils, that is now regulated. It is. Yeah. Yep. And of agriculture. Mm -hmm. Do they have to go through that? Or? So we're, <coughs> we're concentrating more at the product level instead of the retail level. So those products, um, we've, uh, at this point, we've done a cross section. We had 400 ish, 461 growers. Um, we tested about 40 growers, so less than 10%. Uh, the fields. Um, Can you import CBD from other states? Yes. So we don't know what those. We don't know what's in those. Well, we know the what's guy that, that in the article that tested positive and lost his job or couldn't get the job. So could have been bought it from some other state. That was bought here in Vermont. We do have the sample in our laboratory. We did test that to make sure it was below 0.3. We haven't been working. Anybody who's complained that their that some of their neighbor growing hemp or a product they purchased was not hemp, we have run it through the lab. So we responded to every complaint we got, and we did receive four in the sum. What is the Department of Agriculture agency? Department. Sorry, agency of agriculture. What is the role of the agency of agriculture? And you see it in a regulated marijuana market. So we're largely going to leave that up to you folks. Uh, and here's, here is, um, this is very similar testimony uh, that was presented for S-241 years ago and, um, and uh, to the commission. And under the commission's report, if you flip to the second page, that sort of outlines the infrastructure there. Um, I did, the only thing I did to this um, was put your cannabis control board on top. So my understanding in the bill is there's a five-member cannabis control board. And whether or not they're paid or unpaid is yet to be determined. Who they're appointed by is spelled out in the bill. And then the Cannabis Control Board has two staff, an executive secretary. The, the vision is that the board members would be paid a per diem. Okay. The chair of the board would be paid some salary. And the, they would have some full-time staff on the board. Mm -hmm. But it's not intended to create this huge. Okay. So it's, it's basically the bulk of the work that needs to get done. Um, and that's outlined here in the, in this was prepared for 241. All of the pieces of a regulated market. This is a sort of licensed growers, facilities, um, established site requirements, site inspection, growing inspection, pesticide use. Um, also the processors, uh, what solvents they can use, what solvents they can't. Testing for residual solvents, seeds, 
seed certification, and then the consumer protection piece. And these are all things that the Agency of Agriculture does. So you, your job is sort of to create the overall umbrella, um, and that's in the Cannabis Control Board. Um, as a regulator, I sort of think of the foundation first. So this is ground up. And for all three programs, whether it's adult use or disowner or the hemp program, the foundation of that is the laboratory. It is in the lab. And it's sort of, that's where you get your data from about what needs to be regulated and how. Um, whether that's certifying third-party laboratories that do the work, like the health department does with the drinking water program, um, or the state itself having the quality control laboratory. And um, the, the front page of this highlights all the regulatory programs that the agency has, has and, and how um, a regulated cannabis market would fit into that. Um, I threw hemp in here as well, mm -hmm. right next to medical and adult use, because with the CBD market, it really has all the same concerns, and there will be a lot of combined products. Um, as you heard from the dispensary. Yeah, are people doing things besides that and that? So, yeah, yeah there like is. Uh, I use this as a prop. This is all yeah. done. Yeah. So, um, we don't have the fiber infrastructure really yet, but uh, down in Middlebury, there's the top of white used to own Full Sun Oil. He sold it to folks from Kentucky. Now it's Victory Hemp, and they do. We had about 160 acres in seed crop, but that was... This is from Rick Seeds, and if you want yeah. to go on his website, <laughs> yeah. you can purchase them. <laughs> so we are, there is a lot of talk about that with the folks in the hemp industry. Um, we have the, the food, basically cooking oil slash high protein seed, which is going for animal feed right now, but we don't have the infrastructure for um, fiber, long or short, in the state currently. Um, we're hoping to see that develop in the next few years. So veterinarians and, and uh, other using this for animals? There are a significant number of animal products on the shelf right now with CBD in it. Um, and I, I personally don't know if that endocannabinoid system exists in animals. I would defer to Moni uh, or somebody who's studying that. Um, that said, the last thing on here, Senator, you'd asked sort of about retail. Um, when we first spoke of in S-241, um, it would have been the Agency of Agriculture regulating growers, processors, mm -hmm. and the retail market. Um, the commission proposed that the Agency of Agriculture regulate growers and processors, and that the retail markets be regulated under um, liquor and lottery. Um, and I just gave you a quick synopsis of, of the types of retail establishment that the Agency of Agriculture does regulate. We basically regulate every retail establishment in the state in some form or another, whether that's the scanner um, or the scale. Any scanner or scale or pump meter is registered and regulated by the Agency of Agriculture. Um, it's limited in what products we regulate at the retail level, but our most, most the one I keep coming back to, and basically because I've dealt with it for years, is pesticide products and restricted use pesticide products, as well as feed, seed, and fertilizer. Those products are regulated as. Uh, I'm just, uh, as one of the sponsors, and the first six names on the list met several times during mm -hmm. the fall and, uh, over developing S54. Open to having more of a role for the agency of agriculture down this vision right now. If you have suggestions for language to add to S54 to provide a bigger role for the agency, which is already established and already doing the testing of the vision for it. But I think the committee would be happy to look at that. I can't provide But it was just kind of an idea that came up. 
Yeah. No, and I can I can see that I read through S54, and like I said, it creates a very good umbrella um, for regulation underneath it. Um, like I said, I be, from being a regulator for years, the building the foundation and the ground up approach to meeting in the middle is, is what I can offer. Okay. Other questions? Just a quick one on your map. Yeah. Are those accurate? Those six counties? Yes. And if you'll... Is that just because there's only two people registered? Because I can't believe there's only 11 acres in this cultivation. That's your gut. I mean, that... I don't even think that's John Rogers' fields. Yeah. <laughs> I, can, uh, I can get you those, those specific figures. But uh, these, are, these are accurate. Yep. Um, <laughs> and so there, most people are registered an acre or two. Um, and if you look at Caledonia, oh, most of those the acres. The acreage, though, that you've got here listed is directly applied to the number of the registrant. Yes, five and a half acres. So there's possibly other people out there that are not registered and we have more acres than the people out there. There could be. Uh, there could be. And this year's registration, it's all done with... Um, G GPS points and Google Maps. How would you find them? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> there is a term that we locals call gorilla farming. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll pick up.